Okay, guys, can y'all see me now? I'm going to let y'all come on. My apologies because uh, I'm getting to know, and I should have read. I just found out on the internet all I had to do was double t um, click the camera. So I'm going to let a few of y'all come on. Hey, beautiful, how you doing? Thanks. Y'all forgive me. I had a four-hour nap. Thank you, sis. Thank you, and so are you. Oh, I'm going to tell y'all how God um, supernaturally delivered me from debt. Um, I'm going to give a few people a few more minutes to come on because I know um, a lot of y'all got knocked over. Not knocked over, but cut off because of me. But I'm still learning this, y'all. Just be patient with me. Hey, sis, how you doing? Oh, thank y'all for the hearts. I like the hearts. So this this is exciting. This is my first time doing um, Periscope. Hey, beautiful. Hey. This is my first time doing Periscope, and I'm excited about it. Um, I've been telling myself to do it all week long. Yeah, I, I wish I had known. I, I move too fast sometimes, y'all. I go straight into um, just trying to fix it. Yes, it is. So I know now to double tap. I know y'all were probably screaming when I um, cut it off for those of you who are um, on there. And do me a favor, guys. I see somebody who, um, that shared. Thank you. Share it because I know some people are up in the midnight hour. I'm an owl. You know, well, I'm not going to say owl because that's um, demonic. But I'll say this. I'm nocturnal. Um, I'm usually up. Hey, gorgeous. I'm usually up this time of the evening. Um, matter of fact, I just woke up from a four-hour nap. And so I'll be up. Um, if y'all screen for, uh, freezes, just let me know. Thank you. So, yeah, I want to tell you, I'm going to let it get up to, I'm just going to let it get to one more person. Let one more person come on and then that's it. And then that's it. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sorry if y'all have to deal with this one. Come here. Here. If you hear this right here, y'all already know who it is. I'll try to give you an angle of it right here. Come here. Oh, he camera shot. Come here. Come here. Yeah, if this one here. If y'all hear this, here's the culprit right here. This right here. Oh, praise God. Yeah, if you hear, this is right here. This and him. Praise God. I'm always happy to hear people walking away from bad relationships. Because, um, say hi. I'm always here, glad to hear about that because, you know, I've had my experiences. And God taught me a lot in it. Because I had to come out of a generational curse. And that was my thing. And I think that a lot of women are, um, yes, he is a big boy. But a lot of women are following a generational curse, a generational mindset. No, he doesn't. He doesn't ever want to share me. Ever. Ever. Seriously. My mom says she feels sorry for my husband. But, you know, that's it. So, guys, I want to tell you how God supernaturally delivered me from debt. And um, it's just my excuse to come out and do this episode. Y'all, excuse me. But it's just my excuse to come out and do Periscope for the first time. But I want to tell you, um, a lot of times when you tell somebody that God supernaturally delivered you from something, there are some people who think their debt is too bad that God can't deliver them from it. So you got a lot of people right now who are in debt and they're saying, well, I got... They saying, I got this and I got that. So let me tell you what I had um, so you'll know that you can't be delivered. I had a foreclosure on a home that I only had for one year. I was married and we stayed in that house less than a year before we started going through a divorce. And I couldn't afford it. Actually, I probably could have afforded it if my mindset had been different. I just didn't know how to, you know, manage the whole thing. Um, so I went straight into the just you know, depression and what have you and not knowing how to deal with it. And then um, I've had several repossessions on cars. I tell you, my mind was screwed up. Oh, trust me, mine's was, my credit score, guys, was in the 400s. 
So, yeah, mine was in the 400s. I'm sorry, y'all. Here we go right here. But um, my credit score was in the 400s, and I used to actually laugh about my credit score. It was in the mid-400s, the high-400s. I don't remember. But I used to actually laugh at my credit score. And I thought it was a joke. I thought that, you know, all these people are rich anyway, so it's not going to hurt them to have to deal with my, you know, me not paying them. And that's a mindset I grew up in. And for me, when I was little, I wish I could find something that was, um, my dad used to have these little cards. We, he, there was these cards came in the mail. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm 39, so some of you, you probably don't know, but um, they used to have these little cards come in the mail and it would be in a stack. It would be a whole lot of them. And what my dad used to do on each card, it was an advertisement and it had a place where you can write your name, your address, and at the back of it said, no shipping if mailed in the USA. And you can, what you're doing is ordering what's on that car, card, and then you would have um, them to ship it to you. So what ended up happening was my dad used to have us sit down. Well, I used to sit down with my dad and fill out those cards just to get free stuff in the mail. And the stuff wasn't free. It would be $14.99 um, or $14.95, $39.95, or what have you. Yes, you remember. So I, we would get those cards in the mail, and I'm sorry, y'all. But um, we would get those cards in the mail, and when we got those cards, we would fill them out, and we would get a lot of stuff in the... Really, Milo? But we would get a lot of stuff in the mail, and my dad would just avoid paying the bill. He does that every time, y'all. But he would avoid paying the bill. We would just take it and toss it in the trash. As a matter of fact, yeah, he testifying. He really is. But as a matter of fact, what he would do, what I would do as a little girl, and I was eight years old when I remember that used to happen for the most part, we used to go outside. Well, I would go to the mailbox. I'd get it, and I'd bring it in the house. Well, I would toss it outside, and I would brag, hey, Dad, you got some bills in the mail, but I threw them in the, gray, in the uh, trash. And he would say, oh, that's good, or what have you. So I grew up. Yeah, y'all y'all pray for Milo. I grew up with a mindset that was really bad. So when I turned 18, y'all know you get a lot of credit card applications and stuff in the mail. Right before I turned 18, I got a lot of stuff in the mail. And all I saw was free stuff. And see, we grew up poor. We didn't have all that stuff. So um, I ran and I got, I signed up for every credit card that was offered to me. And I went and I went into debt and I went, got Sears credit card. I went and got um, JCPenney credit card, every last one of them. And so I was walking around. You know, you watch too, too much television. I was walking around like a woman out of Hollywood wearing sunglasses, carrying a bunch of bags or what have you, stuff I saw on TV, knowing good and well I couldn't pay them people. And I was working at Walmart. I was work, working in retail. So what ended up happening was I was messing my credit up. Then turned around and got married. His credit was messed up. Mine was too. We thought it was funny. So we would go to places and get furniture on credit and laugh about the, when we heard the printer going off for a long time, we would joke about, no, that's your credit report. Nope, that's your credit report. So um, long story short, my credit was messed up. So when we got into a house that we could not afford, we were struggling together to pay for that house. And when we started going through a divorce, I kept the house and what have you, and I couldn't pour, uh, afford to pay it. So I went into a, a, shade, a state of shock, and what I did was I just stopped thinking about the bills. I just stopped considering them. I just tried to pay what I could. I didn't worry about the mortgage anymore. I just sat there and let that house win because that was the way I did. You know, a lot of people cope differently. That was the way I coped, and um, I ended up losing that house. I lost it to foreclosure, what have you. So my credit score was ugly my credit score was like i said in the 400s and i didn't even worry about it so when i got married again the now ladies i want to tell you something sometimes what the devil meant for evil god will turn it around for your good when i got married again you know i got married to a, a cameroonian guy and i just didn't i didn't know any better but i was used to us having the type of marriage um, I was used to my previous marriage where we blended our finances. And here this man was saying, I don't want to blend our finances. He said, your credit is bad and I don't want them to take it out on me. 
But I knew better. I knew it was something. And eventually I found out he was hiding money. That was the reason why he did that. But he meant it for evil because he had plans, you know. But God meant it for good. God had something else planned. So we moved to Germany, came back to the States, and I decided to start my own business. And I started working from home. Wasn't making that much money, but he was making the money. And he had me thinking he was making a little bit of money. So I don't want to get into that. But what ended up happening was I... God changed my mind. I went through a process of dying. I went through a process of having my mind renewed. I went through a whole different process. And what ended up happening was at the end of it, I had been married to him for five years. At the end of it, I had already stopped getting credit cards. I wasn't working in a traditional marketplace. Um, I didn't have any credit with anybody except for the credit, the stuff that I owed. And I was always in prayer. And the man that I was married to, it, he had a mindset that I had never seen before. I, I witnessed, witnessed a friend of mine, what she would do, and this is almost income tax season, y'all, so y'all hear me with this. For those of you who get a refund, you get a large amount of money back. I had a friend who would get her refund, and her refund would be like $8,000, $9,000, $10,000, and she would pay up her rent for a year. She would go to her landlord and pay her rent for a year. No, excuse me, she would pay it up for six months. She would pay up her rent for six months. She would pay up her car note for six months. And she would pay up her car insurance for six months. And she was struggling. She was on public assistance, but she was doing good. And I watched her. And I sat back and I, I was working with a lot of women. And praise God, hey, sis. But I watched her. And I was working with a lot of women. And God was showing me a difference. So what ended up happening was... This girl was struggling financially. Like she, like I said, she was on public assistance. A lot of times she would, she would be unemployed. She was going to school. So what would happen was I'm watching all these girls that I work with come in, and they would have new cars during tax season, new cars, new this and new that. But by a few months later, they would be sitting back and they'd be broken, hiding their car from the repo man. But this particular friend of mine, she would pay her stuff off for six months. So for six months, she was relaxing. She had no problems for a whole six months. And then six months later, she would take her st student check and pay off her rent, her car note, and her insurance for another six months. And I watched her. And here I was working with no kids, and I was struggling. And I watched her, and she's out six months living rent-free, happy. But the only difference between her and a lot of you was you were shopping. During the time you got your your taxes, you went shopping. You had a moment of fun. Yes. Yeah, that's what they were doing. They were hiding it. But you had a moment of fun. She had an extension of livelihood, of fun. She had an extension. of. And so what God taught me through that was watching her that that's how you're supposed to live. Sometimes we, we exchange our lifestyles for moments. And what ended up happening was there was... Like I said, I was married to this guy, and I wanted to get furniture on credit, and he said no. And I was throwing a fit because, you know, I'm American. We, we're used to credit. And I said, no, I want to get everything on credit. I want to get because we didn't have furniture. We just moved back to the States. We didn't have a couch. We didn't have a bed. We were sleeping on an air mattress. And I had a really bad attitude about that because I felt entitled. You know, I'm entitled to a bed. I'm entitled to this. So I had a really bad attitude about it. And I joke. Um... With it, you know, people about it, I, I was mad at him, and I said, well, you know, you're probably used to sitting on the floor, and he just said, I don't care what you say. We're going to um, we're gonna wait or what have you. So long story short, y'all, my credit was jacked up. This man wouldn't allow us to get furniture, which was a blessing. He said no to credit, so we had no choice but to get everything one by one when we could afford it. So what he would do was he came home. And he said, we got the money for a couch now. And when we had the money for a couch, we went and got a couch. When we had the money, he said, we're going to go get a bed. And I'm going to show you how good God is. He said, we're going to go get a bed. And he said, that we can afford a bed and we'll come back and get the mattresses when we can't afford it. I'm sorry, I'm trying to stop. Oh, that's that one right there behind me. But um, he said, we'll go get a mattress when we can afford it. And one of his co-workers said, I'm going to take y'all down to Ikea so that you can look at some beds and everything. We can do window shopping. They took us down there on a Saturday. We got down there to Ikea, and 
we picked out a bed. It was $2.99 for the frame. So that was our plan. We're going to go back and we're going to get the frame for the bed. In about a month, we're going to get the mattresses. Or two weeks, we're going to go get the mattresses when he get paid again. Um, We went down there. Like I said, priced it at $2.99 in prayer or what have you. But long story short, I went. we went back two weeks later to get the bed. And when we got out there in the parking lot, there was this big old sign outside of Ikea said the bed had been dropped down to $1.99. They had a picture of that particular bed said now $1.99, $100 off. So we went in, got the bed, and at the same time, I had a little money. And so I called around while he was at work the next day. I found, uh, well, I got a newspaper. And in the newspaper, it said new mattresses, $150. Now, the bed that we had was the type that... You didn't need a box spring. You just needed the, so it was saying brand new mattress is 150 So I called the company and I said, do you deliver? I got the money now, um, but if you can deliver the bed. And they said, okay, yeah, we can deliver it, what have you. And they went ahead and trusted me to drive out there and deliver it. And that's how it started. That time, like I said, you know, um, he didn't want me to um, be in his finances or what have you. And so what ended up happening was I wasn't in the traditional marketplace for about five years. And that's not counting the time that I was um, not getting credit before that, before he and I got married. So long story short, y'all know about the seven-year window. The stuff falls off your credit after seven years. If they can't um, contact you or what have you, obviously they couldn't contact me because they didn't know my name. And they didn't know. And my thing was it wasn't me trying to make it fall off my credit report. In all our honesty, I was planning to go back and pay everybody. My mind changed for real. I was planning. I said, I'm going to get myself together because the Bible said, pay a man what you owe him. So I said, I'm going to get myself together and I'm going to go and pay off all of this debt. I'm going to, and that was what I kept saying. I'm going to build this business. I'm going to make some money or what have you. I'm not going to rely on the guy. I'm going to make some money and I'm going to go and pay off everybody. So what ended up happening was when he and I went through a divorce, we were both under the, the misconception that my credit was still jacked up. And um, we went through the divorce and um, everybody thought that I wasn't going to be able to survive because he appeared to be the breadwinner. But my business had kicked off and he didn't know it because he had separated our money. Like I said, what the devil meant for evil, God turns it around for your good. Because he has separated our money. He, he never wanted our money to be together. So he didn't know how much money I had stored. He didn't know what I had. So when he walked out, he said, are you going to move back to Mississippi? I said, no, I'm going to stay here. We were in Florida. I said, I'm going to stay here. He said, can you afford that? I said, I'll be okay. God's got me. And um, I ended up keeping the apartment that we were living in. I stayed there for about, I think, a little over a year or what have you. Oh, so by that time, my mindset had changed. By that time, I believed I, I had the same mindset that I had picked up from him, which was don't buy anything. Hear me. If you can't afford it, then it ain't your time to have it. There's a season for everything. If you can't afford to pay for it cash, it's not ready for you. You're not ready for it. Don't worry about it. If you can't afford to get a couch on cash, then the best thing to do is get some bean bags. Get something and sit around. Stop worrying about what people are going to say about you. Stop competing with the Jones. Stop worrying about, well, I want my house to look like this and want my house to look like that. Don't do that. You, you're wasting your time. What ended up happening with me was God blessed me to the point where I went to check my credit one day. And do you know I had no debt? None. Zero. None. Everything. I had already started paying off people. I had already just started, you know, just going at it a little bit at a time. And in that time, anytime I got a bill for anything, I paid it off. You know, I don't care if it was the last dime that I had, I paid it off. That was my thing. I kept doing it. That's right, competing puts so many people in debt. Honestly, competition is the number one reason people are in debt. For example, how many of you, how many channels do you watch on television? Most people watch about two or three channels. But most people pay $150, $180, $200 a month for cable. Why? So they can keep up with the Joneses. So they can be able to come to work and say, girl, did you hear what happened on Empire? Did you hear what happened on Scandal last night? I have never, and I'm not bragging on this, I'm bragging on my God. I've never watched Empire a day in my life. I've never watched Scandal because I'm busy. 
I'm not going to waste my time getting addicted to something. Understand this, y'all. A lot of us have addictive personalities. I'm not going to lock into something when I can lock into work. I can be doing something for the kingdom and building instead of sitting back talking about, girl, did you have, hear what happened to whatever? I think I've heard um, whichever episode, whichever one of those shows, they got somebody named Candy. I don't know. But so I'm not wasting my time on that type of stuff. When people are paying, playing Candy Crush, I'm not wasting my time on Candy Crush. You know what I watch when I'm watching television? I like to watch educational shows. Like somebody said, I like to watch home buying shows. I like to watch shows about buying property in other countries. So what, what God did with me, with my credit, was he changed my mind. And while my mind was changing, and I was paying off people, and I was forsaking credit, any opportunity to get credit, God turned around and wiped my credit clean. He cleaned it all the way off, y'all. There is nothing on my credit report right now, nothing, not even a foreclosure. And I didn't even know those would come off your credit report. Honestly, I didn't. I thought, you know, but all of those things came off of my credit report. So right now, when I go on my credit, my credit score used to be about 450. My credit score right now is 725. Is 725. When I go in there, and the funny part is, is that God delivered me from debt at a place and at a time where I really don't need credit anyway, because I don't use credit. I, I, I don't use credit. Anything that I get, I have to be able to afford it. I prayed about Milo for three months before I got him. See, I found out that what God does for us, the believer, is that he wants us to have that type of relationship where we're consulting with him about what we can and what we cannot get. What he wants us to do is to pay off people and stop worrying about your friend pulling up in her brand new car. When y'all see me pull up in a brand new car, it's going to be because it's paid off. It's not going to be because it looks real nice and everybody is driving around in one. Yes, yeah, say no to credit cards, pay them out. If you got a credit card, pay it off, kill it. And for those of you who are, you're saying that you want to get married, you got to, I want to tell you something that God told me. Before God will reveal you to your husband, you got to be a good thing. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from God. You got to be a good thing. That man can't find you if you're buried in debt because he's not finding a good thing. If he finds you and you're buried, it's because God has given you the keys to come out and you're beating your way up out of that debt. God is not going to send a man to find you and your, 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 your bad credit. And while you're sitting there struggling, what God wants you to do is you prepare to be a good thing while you are in waiting. A lot of women, and I know that I'm from um, Mississippi, a lot of women are with the me mentality that um, I'm going to wait for a man to come. And when a man comes, we have a two-income home, I can pay off my debt. Don't do that. Go ahead and say, Go ahead and get, that's what you can buy within your budget. Go ahead and buy or start, go ahead and start paying off whoever you owe. Just do it. What you do first and foremost, because debt is not just natural, it's supernatural. Because the Bible says, oh, no man, no thing but to love them. And God said, I have made you the head and not the tail. You are the lender and not the borrower. You, you come behind and no good thing. You go into error the minute you go and borrow money from somebody. That's why I tell people, for those of you who are dependent on other people, I tell people, be careful because sometimes that's a spirit. I've met people who have a spirit of dependency. You know, they, they have to depend on people. They're always depending on somebody. That is a spirit. So that's something you have to be delivered from. As a matter of fact, ladies, um, and I don't know if there's any guys on here, but for ladies, I want to tell you this. As a matter of fact, you don't even want to be dependent on your husband. Your husband's going to take care of you. He's going to cover you. But you want to always be dependent on God. That's right, because when I, whenever I had to move in with somebody, when I was going through a divorce, um, first time I got married, when I had to move in with somebody, I had a lot of struggle. And even though I was trying to be the best roommate ever, I was trying to, you know, pay bills, trying to help clean. And I kept offering to cook, and she was like, no, she was the cook in her house. She didn't want nobody else to cook. But, um, you know, I kept trying to be the best roommate ever, or what have you. But at the same time, it was hard. It was very hard to live with somebody, because you have your way of doing things. So... The thing is, you don't want to owe anybody anything. Right now, y'all, this is what you do. This, this is how you start freeing up some of your finances for those of you who are struggling. Get rid of cable. 
uh, y'all heard me right. The heart stopping. I love you still. Get rid of cable. Get Netflix. You know, you don't need cable. You don't need to keep up with anybody. Get rid of cable. Get yourself some Netflix and you can have your internet or what have you. When it comes to your car, make sure if you got a car note, pay that thing out. If you can't afford, if you're struggling with that car note, you can see about getting somebody. Yeah, just internet. But you can see about getting somebody to take up your notes and you go get something you can afford when you get your taxes. It is. But it's, it's when you get your taxes, for those of you who are getting taxes, take the money that you get and go get yourself a car. My car cost me $3,600. Do I want a new car? Yes. But in the meantime, when I walk on the note, when I walk on there, I'm going to go and say, hey, listen, here's the money for the car. And if I can't afford the car, I'm not going to worry about it. I will be taking taxi cabs and doing whatever, but I'm not going to worry about it. Get your, get rid of the car notes. Don't, you don't have to drive around in something brand new. I understand that it's embarrassing sometimes, you know, uh, none of us want a clunker. You know, but one thing I've learned is that if you ask God, God will give you a really decent car. He gave me a decent car and I paid, like I said, I think it was 36, it was 3400 or $3,600 for it. I paid for the car and I kept praying. Hear me when I say this. My life is supernatural, y'all. My life is, I have a prayer life. My life, I've been nothing but just a prayer, just a, a prayer warrior and just a person who prays all the time and relies on God and asks God's questions for years. And I asked the Lord for the car and I asked him to show me what car to get. And I went on Craigslist. And God kept bringing me back to the car that I have. And I kept going out of it because I didn't want a little bitty car. I kept um, going out and, you know, just going back in. And he kept leading me back to that car. So finally, I reached out to the guy, talked to him. And I was going through a divorce at the time. And we, I asked my ex to drive me down there because it was an hour and a half away. Do you know that the guy that I bought the car from turned out to be a mechanic who had taken really good care of that car? car looks good on the outside and the inside that man took a immaculate care of that car that's why god kept bringing me back to it and then the guy turned out to be christian it was him and he came out there with his wife he was um christian and we talked about the lord and it was amazing but i ended up driving away with a car that was paid for and here here's another thing pay off your car insurance six months at a time if you can the, the way that you get rid of debt, what makes it a lot easier if, if you eliminate your monthly bills as much as you can. Don't sit back there and have car note insurance, rent, um, cable, electric, um, telephone. Y'all don't need no house phone. Um, don't, don't sit up there and breathing room. <laughs> but don't sit up there and waste your time getting all that stuff. What I do is I like to keep my bills to a minimum every month. My only bills that I'm paying now is I'm leasing this house. I pay off the lease um, and just bills, just the electric bill, water bill, cell phone. I got Metro. Yeah, I have to do a delivery service. All right. But um, Metro and that's it. Y'all, I kill my bills when it comes to my insurance. At one point, there was one time when I got the bills in the mail, and I would get real frustrated when the insurance thing came out. And because um, I would have to pay the six months, they'll send the thing, and they'll tell me, we're about to take this much money out of your account on this particular day. And I'm like, oh, gosh. But I pay it off. Now, I just let it go ahead and go. It doesn't matter what I've had in my account, what I didn't have. I didn't worry about it. I just made sure the money was there. And I let them take the money out of the account six months. I don't worry about that for six months. And I know some people say, well, my car insurance will probably be $60 to $100 a month. It doesn't matter. That stuff add up, y'all. If you got a bunch of um, bills that are $60 and $80, they're going to add up eventually. And the next thing you know, you'll be struggling. My mom, and she would probably, she would try to whoop me if she heard me tell y'all. But, um, yeah, I, Sprint, I can't do Sprint. Metro. You can do a $45 a month. That's it. That's what your bill is. No extra hidden fees and all that other stuff. I don't need all that fancy, you know, stuff or what have you. But, yeah, I heard T-Mobile was okay. But what I did, like I said, was I got rid of it. But my mom, my mom, she had that 
that poverty mindset. Like I said, she would whip me if she heard me telling y'all this. But she had that poverty mindset, and um, she was out struggling financially. But every time you look around, she's like, I got a new air conditioner from a furniture company, and I'm paying a monthly note on it. And I said, Mom, why you keep doing that? If you can't afford it, go get yourself a fan. You know, go get you an air conditioner, what have you. But she, she had an air conditioner. She just wanted something new. You know, so what you do is you get what you can't afford. When you go to the store, if you need something, sometimes you need to get the cheapest thing if, if that's what you could afford. And then, too, hear me, some of y'all got to take out of your diva account. I'm going to wait for y'all. I'm going to see if I'm going to still get some love for that one. You got to take out of your diva account. Where's the love? Where's the love? I love y'all. But you have to take out of your diva account. And what I mean by that is... You got to stop spending so much time trying to get this done and this done and trying to do this. Y'all, look at my hands. I've never had my nails done in my life. And I'm not telling you not to get your nails done, but I'm saying if you can't afford to do it, then look, just go out there and be you. The thing is, we spend so much time trying to impress people. We spend too much time trying to look a certain way. They got the lashes and stuff. Y'all notice I don't have any lashes. You know, I know y'all probably thought I was going to come out of full ensemble, big lashes and all that other stuff. It's a waste of time because here's the thing. This is what God gave me right here. You know, I do have, you know, my eyebrows don't grow, so um, I do pencil them in. But this is what God gave me right here. That's what that's what he gave me. So what he gave me, people going to either love it or they're not. I'm not going to go put on somebody else's face to make somebody like me. I don't care. Because at the end of the day, they, they're not going to pay my bill. At the end of the day, they're not going to do anything for me. I got to pay for that stuff. So listen, I'm not going to go and, and spend a bunch of money. That's right, true love comes from within. I'm not going to go and spend a lot of money on something I can't afford. I'm not going to go and spend a lot of money trying to look a certain way. And I come out here and y'all can't recognize me. And y'all looking at me and I'm five shades lighter. And I got on these big old eyelashes. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here. Look, I know this is... Yeah, this is synthetic. I don't do human hair. But this is the thing that um, God has taught me. Learn to love this right here that God gave you. Look at it. Love it. Learn to love your own face. Stop looking at folks on TV. That's why y'all need to stop watching Scandal in some of them shows. Because them folks telling y'all how y'all need to look. And everybody walking around looking the same old way. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody's walking around looking the same way. Everybody's walking around. And they are... You know, all dolled up. I'm going to tell y'all something. When I was married, both times, both I've never met a man who said, I like you better in your makeup. I've never met him. And if there's any guys on here, just tell me. I'm going to tell you what men always say. Why you put all that stuff on your face? We put on makeup for women, y'all. So we can look, we, we can sit up there and look. And I'm not saying, I'm not against makeup. I'm against somebody putting on so much makeup that they don't look like themselves anymore. When you lose your identity, men like... When a man marries you, he got to wake up to you without the makeup. You don't wake up looking like they do on television. You wake up without, um, like I said, I pencil my eyebrows in. I wake up without eyebrows. I wake up, you know, and this is, this is just me. So I've had to learn, and it was hard for me because there was a time where the enemy taught me that, you know, this wasn't enough. You need to change this and you change it. Yeah, men do some, a lot of men do get mad when they see you putting a lot of mess on your face. They don't like it, especially when you lose your identity in it. Because, honestly, can I tell y'all something? Half of the folks lose their personality. They start picking up another personality when they put on all that makeup. They don't, they don't know how to be themselves. A lot of women go out there, and I remember an old beautician I had. She told me how people would change. Like, the minute they sit in her chair, and from the moment they sit in her chair, they're, they're humble. But by the time their hair is finished... They got a different personality. You know, so that's the thing. A lot of times we're too busy trying to be somebody else. My God appointed husband, your God appointed husband going to want your face. That's it. So stop putting all that money into trying to be who you are not. You know, just be yourself. You know, for me, this is it's just me. I, God had to break me out of some stuff. He took me out of human hair. What about black women who like blonde hair? I, I'll say this. 
we, there is an identity identity crisis with a lot of us, and that's because we live in the United States. I love y'all, but I. I Okay, guys, sorry about that. Look like we got knocked out. And I do want to address that question. Um, I want to let the... Yeah, he's mad. He's mad. He always mad. But you know something? That... I always say, if the enemy is not mad at you, he must be proud of you. And we don't want him to be proud of us. So I'm going to let a couple of y'all get back on, and then I want to answer that question. Because... Um, from fake eyelashes, yeah. I, look, I almost got tempted to go get some fake eyelashes, but the Lord was like, okay. He knows how to get me. He always has me to do research, and when I did research and I saw that I would be putting a mink, an animal, on my face, and I, God has blessed me to cast out what they call animal spirits. And I thought about that. I said, I don't want that on my face. Hey, beautiful. Okay, guys. So, um, yeah, some of them are mink. Some of them come from other stuff. But I, honestly, I really don't want to be too fake. You, that, that's the reality. Synthetic eyelashes. You know, I, if I put on eyelashes, I'll probably pull them back off. I really don't want to be too fake, y'all. I just want to be me. Because um, my goal, my, my thing, what I want to do, I want to be, when I'm 80, I want to look 40. When I'm 80, I want to look 40. That, that's how I want to be. I don't want to... Um, spend too much time throwing money at Hollywood because that's what they're doing is they're promoting and they're helping to um, build and, you know, helping to bring finances into whatever they're, whatever it is that they're promoting. So what about blonde hair? I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm completely against people who do it. I'm not against them. I will say that, that we do have an identity crisis in the um, United States. A, a lot of us who are African-American, and the reason is because, you know, television shows us that, you're supposed to look this way and look that way. And a lot of people get so caught up in that to the point where you can, I've seen people, a lot of people can be in ministry and they've accepted Jesus Christ, but they rejected themselves. That's the reality. A lot of people accept Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they reject themselves. And when they reject themselves, then what they do is they go and they put on some blonde hair and the enemy says, hey, you look better now. And then the enemy says, but, you know, you don't have enough makeup on. Then they go put on a lot of makeup. And then the enemy says, you, you know what? You, um, you look better now, but you got to go and get some contacts and put it in your head. And this, the enemy did that to me as well. I, didn't, I did the red hair, kind of, not the red, but the auburn colored. I did the contacts for a while. And then one day the Lord told me he was delivering me from it. And he took me through a season. Y'all, when I tell y'all I felt eight shades of ugly, he took me through a season where he wouldn't allow me to wear, well, he took me out of human hair. He delivered me from human hair, and then he took me through a season of having to look at myself in the mirror without makeup, and every time I tried to do makeup, y'all, I'm telling you, I was drawing one eyebrow up here, one eyebrow over across here. It was like, um, I was messing everything up, but... I'm not against makeup. I think that makeup is good. I want to do a photo shoot soon. So I want to do, you know, I want to get some, um, I already got the girl that I, I, I want to do my makeup. So that, you know, I think it's good for things like that. But when it, when you're to the point like I was where I couldn't walk out the door without having makeup on, you need deliverance. If you can't go to the store without putting on makeup, you, you got, you need deliverance because that's what, what's happening is it's called a lying spirit. A lying spirit has told you that you're not pretty. That's a lying spirit because y'all hear me. You are a masterpiece because you were created by the master. God created you to be different. He created you to look like, you know, just like we got different fingerprints. Some of you, you see me, I'll be at the Generals of Deliverance Conference, okay? You will identify me based on my pictures. This is my fingerprint. This is my fingerprint. This is how you'll, you'll say, I know you from your, I saw this and I saw that. So, you know, that's the thing. We got to learn to embrace our fingerprints and stop scraping off our fingerprint and trying to have the same fingerprint as somebody else. Because sometimes a lot of people go into debt because they were too busy spending their time trying to look like somebody else. They were too busy. I, I can't wait to go. Yeah, I can't wait. But too busy spending their time. They spend their time and their money trying to look like somebody else. 
Yeah, and that's what society pushes, but um, a lot of times when it comes to us, especially us as African-American women, we, we live in a, a society where European beauty is promoted and, saying, and you're told that, hey, to look this way is not pretty, to look that way is not pretty. But I'll tell you this, have you ever seen, okay, we go by standards, you know, so forgive me for saying this, but have you ever seen, and you've seen this plenty of times, a, a woman who is not considered be beautiful by our standards, as a matter of fact, she's considered unattractive, and you see her with what we would call a fine man, you've seen that, right? And you see that sister got confidence, do you know why that man's with her? Because she's happy with who she are, with who she is, excuse me. She's happy with who she is. She's confident. That's what attracts a man. Here's the secret. She's, that's right. She's confident. Men like confidence. That's the thing. And la ladies, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you a secret. I love y'all. It, it ain't that many of y'all on here right now, so that's, I can tell y'all this secret. I, my friends joke. Well, the people that have been in my life have joked that they said I was the most proposed to woman they've ever met. When I was in the world, it doesn't matter. Let me tell you this something about men um men actually like original they like you to be natural they like you to be yourself they don't want you to lose your personality they don't want you to be like anybody else it's the unique you that no other woman can compete with now if you too busy trying to be like um everybody's trying to be like the hottest star out there if you too busy trying to be like her do you know that you got a lot of competition because there are a lot of other women that are trying to be like her so you, you're basically standing in line and somebody's going to come along and outshine you. They're going to outact you. So if you, or outperform you, excuse me, if you want a man, you want to get married, nobody can compete with you being you. But that's right, nobody else can be you because nobody can compete with you. You have a lot of people who will try to be like you, but nobody can compete with you being you. And y'all forgive me, um, that's right, that's right. Forgive me, I try to get to the, the comments as much as I can, but Nobody can compete with you being you. When you are yourself, you become unique. And I can honestly tell you, this is why I stay hidden. I'm going to tell you why I stay hidden in Christ. I'm letting God choose my husband for me. I can't have male friends, not too much, because somebody will come along and be ready to get married. Somebody will say, Tip, I'm ready. I want to marry you. I think you're a good woman. That's the thing about men. When, you, when God makes you a wife and he declares that you are a wife, you have to stay hidden. Thank you. You literally have to stay hidden because even, you know, like a women, some women say, I got a lot of male friends. You, that means if none of them are trying to come for you nine times out of ten, if they're trying to come for you in the natural, like trying to get you in the bed, that means that they, they see you, that you need deliverance. They know you, you got soul ties. But when you are hidden in God, you can't have a lot of male friends. All I honestly, you got to be prayerful because half of them going to try to marry you. Half of them be sitting up there talking to you and you be thinking that's your boy and all of a sudden, you know, y'all go out somewhere and he get on his knees and marry you. I mean, he get on his knees and propose to you and you're sitting there looking like, oh, what just happened? I'm sorry, y'all. But that's the thing. Stop competing with people. I don't have to compete with anybody else. I just have to be me. Y'all already know. I'm sorry. Uh, that's not me. That's Mr. Come here. Y'all already know. Come here. Here. Come here. Come here. I'll show y'all for those. Yeah, the, the, the same here. For those of y'all who didn't see, this is who's the culprit right here behind this. This is the culprit right here. My baby. This is the culprit. But, um, the close, and I agree, the closer you get to Christ, the less friends you can have um, male-wise. You, you can't have that many male friends. He's two years old. But um, my male friends, honestly, I can honestly say I probably have two male friends, and they're married. You know, I, I don't have single male friends. You know, I, I, I probably have one guy that I talk to every once in a blue moon. Um, but, yeah, that right there. It's, it's nothing to that. I don't have male friends. I don't do male friends. You know, I don't do that. Um, I don't do that. Some guy calling because sometimes you might not realize it, but some men can come into your life and block your husband. Oh, and I, something I learned too. Some women can come into your life and block your husband too. But that's a whole other episode. 
um, when it comes to male friends, I don't, I have two male friends and they are married and I'm cool with them and their wife, you know, and when they call me their wife, nine times out of 10 is right there. I don't, I don't do that whole, you calling me up on the phone, wasting my time and all that other stuff. I don't do that. I, I don't believe in it, but yeah, so, that's a whole other episode. God, I'm telling you, God just gave me some deep revelation about some women, a woman. I, I'll tell you this, the, yes, he did. It looks like he did. Listen up. I'm going to tell you this. I had to, God has delivered me from a lot of friends, a lot of people that have been in my life. And recently he delivered me from a person. And, um, one of, uh, another, a, a prophet of mine, a prophet, a friend of mine, excuse me, reached out to me and told me that, and the, somebody that I knew, a, an apostle had been telling me the same thing. She said that the girl that was in my life, the spirit in her was blocking my husband. And that spirit was acting as a husband. And I didn't know that. And now, mind you, um, there is no, neither one of us are gay or even have gay tendencies. But sometimes a person can come into your life. Want, I want you to understand this. Uh, demons don't have gender. Think about it. They don't have a gender. So they don't have to be in a man to block your husband. They can get in a female. And a female can sit there and take up all your time and call you. I'm, I'm going to tell you, one of the symptoms, if a female calls you up every day, if a woman is calling you every day, that's called a controller, a time waster. God can't send a husband in a situation like that because you don't have, you're not prepared for him. You're too busy. So that that's somebody who is they're just in your life and they're monitoring you. So yet yeah, he God has removed a lot of people from my life. He closes doors, and I tell my friends now, I love you. I said, but don't ever think that you know you're gonna come before God. This thing here for me is all about kingdom. You know, and my closest friends are the ones I talk to probably once a month, once every two, three months, four months, or what have you. That's right. But when it comes to when you gotta have when you have that friend that's gotta call you up seven days a week every day and tell you even what she had for breakfast, that's a spirit. That is a spirit. That is a control of that woman is blocking your husband. And you know what because what ends up happening is you create a codependency with that particular female. Y'all gonna become codependent. You're going to be looking for her call. She's going to be looking for you. You become codependent. So God's not going to send a husband into a situation like that. Is it okay with a spiritual figure? No. I think that um, all conversations, I, I, I found they need to have a purpose. All relationships have to have a purpose and all conversations have to have a pur purpose. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't read the last one. I'm sorry you had to post that again for me. It, they have to have a purpose. Sometimes people call you up like I've had... A couple of my friends, they used to call me up every day just because they were in traffic. You know, they would be in traffic on their way home or what have you. And they'll call me, hey, girl, what you doing? And they'll go to talking. And the Lord dealt with me about that. And he said, do you see how your time is being wasted? And I just kept ignoring it or what have you because, you know, I would be bored from time to time. But since God has delivered me from that, Oh, yeah, I did that with a lot of my friends. Matter of fact, most of my friends, I lose, most of the time when I lose a friend, it's because I rebuke her about a man. It, I, I can honestly tell you that that's how, that's how God drives women away from me. Um, yeah, if the conversation has a purpose, you know, but only in God. If it's a dependency where if I don't call you and you mad at me or she doesn't call you, how do you know when you're delivered from a spiritual spouse? You have to pray about it because sometimes, I mean, sometimes you see the manifestation of a spiritual spouse. Um, but I, I'll go back to the spiritual spouse in a minute. Um, when it comes to a person, if they got to talk to you every day, if you got to tell them your every move, that's a controlling spirit. That's a spirit called control. So you, you got to be careful with that. Um, every time I got rid of a friend who was a controller, every time I got rid of a friend or God delivered me from a controller uh, and a friend, I would get another one like within a, within a week. And it wasn't me going out looking. It was people reaching out to me. And I would try to um, stop. The way you break free from a controller is what happens in you. It's something in you that attracts the controller to you. And it has to die. So they have nothing to feed on. It's just like, okay, it's just like roaches. How do you get rid of roaches? They, you got to clean up your house and you got to make sure they have nothing to eat. You know, you, you, you go through the house and you clean and you bomb it. You, so you're, the, the bomb that you use is prayer and warfare. And you, yeah, don't eat in your room. You could eat in your room, but you just have to be super clean with it. You know, but the thing is, when you get rid of control of the people that God delivered me from, what he did was, you remember this, 
how can two walk together except they be agreed? So there's something in you that's agreeing with something in them. You need to find out what y'all in agreement about, and that thing needs to die. Because if God didn't send them, it's sin. That, that thing there needs to die. Whatever it is, and I'm sorry I had to take uh, him from him so that y'all can hear me. But whatever it, whatever that is keeping your relationship alive with them has to die. When it came from me, for example, my most recent um, friendship that ended, what had to die in me was I had to stop first and foremost, I had to stop with the codependency stuff. Um, I didn't even realize I was being codependent. Yeah, I didn't realize that, you know, for me, I wasn't calling her. She was calling me up every day, but I was allowing it. And I would just say, okay, well, I can use this time to wash dishes or go for a walk or what have you. And God said, that's time I want with you. Sometimes when you're walking, I want to, I want that time with you. When you're washing dishes, I want that time with you. When you don't have nothing to do, you don't need to be on the phone with a person. You know, sometimes we, we, we get bored and we want to talk to people and you don't need that. All you need to do is just take that time out and, and spend it in prayer. Spend that time, you know, analyzing, making a business plan. Y'all, I got, I'm not going to get them. I got notebooks full, full of notes. That's what I do in my spare time. I build. I don't, um, yeah, I don't care what, if they say you're not that busy, it doesn't matter. I don't care what they say. I, you know, for me, my, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm playing tug of war with this one. But, um, here. But, what, for me, one of the things I've learned is that every time, every time God has delivered me from a person like that, do you know that my business expanded and I got a promotion? Y'all, forgive me. But do you know that every time God delivered me from somebody like that, my business was promoted? And he said to me, it would have, you would have had this expansion, this promotion a long time ago had you not had this person occupying your time. So what I do nowadays is I'm intentional, meaning when it comes to people, when I, I have um, people that I talk to from time to time, I don't talk to people every day. Like I said, most of the people I talk to once a month, once every two months, when there's a reason to talk to them. When we, get, if they got a question, if I got a question, if they need prayer, I need prayer. That's what you call having a sister in the Lord. If my sister in the Lord reach out to me and say, hey, sis, can you pray for me? Or what have you, right? People can be distractions. But when they reach out to me and what have you, I'm here for them. And the same thing. But if it's somebody who always needs your time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they calling you up and they always got problems, always talking about, um, so girl, I was at the store, right? And so, um, Mr. Such and Such called me. That's a waste of your time, honestly. Same thing for family. Because one thing that I've noticed is that a, a lot of times when people are too, too family oriented, meaning their family is taking up all that time, God can't use them as much as he wants to. You know, they can't do too much. They're always um, involved in some type of family activity. I take one toy from him, he goes and get another one. Um, but the thing is, you know, they, they'll go, if you got somebody that's taking up too much of your time, you don't have enough time for God, y'all. You got to have that time for God. Christ wants the time because when you go before the Lord, you will find a lot of stuff in you that you didn't know was there. When you go before God, if you feel that, 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 like, I, I need to talk to somebody on board, you need to pray about that. You need to pray it out. You need to say, God, take that out of me. I don't want to de depend on anybody but you. And two, I'm going to tell you this. When you do get married, half of the time, for those of you who have those friends who call you every day, they, they actually do get jealous. And they will get mad. They will get, they will feel like you are tossing them to the side or what have you. Um, what have you. So don't waste your time with that kind of stuff. You know, I spend my time working. I spend my time building. I spend my time praying. I spend my time playing tug of war with this dog. I spend my time doing a lot of other stuff. I don't spend my time... Um, how can you tell if somebody's blocking your husband? Okay, let me get, to, uh, I'm going to ask me that question again in a few minutes. I want to get to the spirit husband, y'all. Um, when, how do you know if you have a spirit husband? The way I, when I had that spirit attacking me, the way I had it was I was having sexual dreams and I didn't know what that meant. You know, at first I knew it was a demon and I was like, okay, but I thought it was just a demon attacking me. You know, I didn't think it was attached. I just thought it was attacking. So I would get up and pray and all that other stuff. 
Yeah, it's not incubus. We call it incubus in the United States. It's actually a spirit husband. When you say when we say incubus and succubus, we actually denote what that spirit is about. And a lot of times what ends up happening is people don't get set free from it because they think that um, it's just there to have sex. It, a demon don't care about sex. It don't have a natural body. It, 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 the whole thing about a spiritual husband is the whole sexual part is to unite you to the, the thing. It's not, it doesn't. It's not, it doesn't have a natural body, so it's not experiencing pleasure. So it's not sex. When we say incubus, we think it's a sex spirit, but in reality, it's called a spirit husband. And when I've taken a lot of women through deliverance from that spirit husband, what ends up happening is, you know, a lot of them have been having sexual dreams. A lot of them keep dreaming about their ex-boyfriend because the spirit husband will put on a mask. It'll come, uh, a spirit husband is what we call incubus in the United States. It's a, it's a demon. That what it does is it'll come into your life, and it usually gets in through witchcraft or generational curses. It, um, witchcraft from reading your horoscope, from um, Ouija boards and stuff that you did in your past, and you'll end up, you know, reading. I mean, you'll end up having a lot of experiences. It actually blocks your husband, and if you have a spirit husband, it won't let you. It won't. First, you can't. Your husband can't find you. If you do happen to get married, it's going to ruin your relationship. It's not going to let you be married. It's going to always take away your peace with the guy. Um, for example, for example, um, women who are married and they're not sexually attracted to their husband, they stop having sex with their husband. Most of the time it's because they have a spirit husband. It's because they got a spirit husband and he takes their desire away from them. Because the thing is, you can't entertain two men at one time and that spirit will sit there and it'll block. So um, a lot of times when uh, spirit husbands, some of the symptoms are having reproductive issues, feeling being barren, barren um, having problems like pain. One of the girls um, that God blessed me to take through deliverance, she had endometriosis. Endometriosis. And, yeah, it causes a division. It will never let the woman be happy with a man. Um, a woman who has a spirit husband, she'll find it, it magnifies every issue that he has. So if you're married to him, every little thing that he does bothers you. You know, he come in and he, you know, um, he drops something on the floor and you're irritated. And you will allow that to blow up into a major fight. A woman who has a spirit husband will tear down her marriage with her own hands. Because she's not, she doesn't have peace. Um, she's not happy. She's not content. Because the thing is, if you got two men, then they're competing. Even if they don't know what they're competing. Well, with a spirit husband, he's going to always win out. Because he, he he's taking away your desire. He's taking away... A lot of stuff. So anytime you're doing, yeah, most a lot of single women have uh, spirit husbands. When I I do I do one on one deliverance and I do the mass deliverances. Well, it's God that does it through me. I want to be careful, but when I do the deliverance, a lot of times one of the ways I can identify a spirit husband is a woman who has constant um, sex dreams, women who have a lot of infections and they don't know why. Um, women who have a lot, it, it's usually in the reproductive area. You, you know, they, they have a lot of problems. So whenever they do that, like I said, it was one girl who had endometriosis or what have you, and she had pretty much given up, and I, I knew it was a spirit husband, and as soon as I started praying against that thing, it started manifesting. Um, and I tell people, you know, when you come out to the prayer calls, y'all, you know, the thing is, you do the renunciation. If you don't have one, you don't have to worry about it. But if you have one, it, it will manifest. It'll start manifesting, and um, one of the ways, and it, y'all forgive me, but I, it's, it's kind of funny for me, you know, um, deliverance is funny sometimes, but one of the ways it starts manifesting is when it starts coming out of a person, a lot of times it starts crying, because it sees the woman as his wife, it sees you as his property, so, and also, when we were doing this debt delivery, it, it does affect your debt. It will attack your debt. It will try to keep you bound. It'll keep you trying. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't mind you going out having relationships with other people. It doesn't mind you having sex with different men. It doesn't mind you being promiscuous. Um, but it does mind mind you being monogamous. Because demons get access to the men through you. You know, they get access to, to them through their sin too. But demons get access to you through men, and they get access to men through you. So anytime you connect with a person, you build a bridge with that person. So demons are always trying to get you to build. And I, I look at it, I like to liken it into building a city or building a country. It's building connections, you know, all these different connections. And that's why you have a lot of women, they get into a relationship, 
and everything is up, up, up. It's, it's great at first, you know, everybody's happy, everybody's in love and everything, and then it just falls apart, and they, next thing you know, you see them um, a year later, they're with somebody else, a year later, they're with somebody else. In most cases, that's a demon. That's a spirit husband. And what it's doing is it's taking away that woman's peace because what it's doing is it's building a network. It's building bridges. You know, it's using that woman to create a soul tie with that man. And um, then it, use, it, it gets rid of the man. And if you don't have my book, Devil Bait, I explain it in the book, Devil Bait. I talk about it a lot in the book, Devil Bait. And, yeah, I mean, it's always good. When it comes to spirits, y'all, I'm going to the Generals of Deliverance Conference now. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going there. I'm going to be in the crowd. If I need any type of deliverance, I'm not going to hesitate. I'm not going to be shamed. I'm not going to be shamed. If I need deliverance, I'm going to be the first one up there. Because the thing is, as Christians, we demons get ways into us. They, I mean, they'll get in. And can you repeat this video? Yeah, of course. Um, demons like to get in. And when they get in, you know, some, like some people in leadership, I met so many leaders who were mean and nasty and they don't know what's wrong with them. They just think that's their natural personality. They need deliverance. And the thing is, I've learned, and that's why I got, so, I got some ministers that I follow real heavy. I love to follow them because they are honest enough to say, that's right, they need a peephole. They're honest enough to say that they, they get constant, regular deliverance and what have you. So... If I need deliverance, I'm, look, I'm sorry. Folks that have to talk about me, I will put a part in the center of my head and say, hit me right here. I, I'm going up there. If I need deliverance, I'm getting it. I'm not going to waste. <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to waste my time to, um, yeah, I'll be the first one in line. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of it because if they got in, they need to come out. I'm not going to be sitting up there trying to look all prim and proper for everybody and getting attacked and stuff and just trying to act all wearing a big hat sitting at the front of the church and trying to act like I got it all together and stuff like that and some demon in the background kicking my tail. No, I want that thing out. I will be the first one. I don't care. Somebody said you don't need to keep reading John Eckhart books. Whoever told you that had a demon. That's why they said that. Whoever said that had a demon. The, the thing is, I, yeah, I love John Eckhart. I love to read his books and stuff. And whoever told you to stop reading it, it that, that was a demon in there. Yeah, I, I guarantee you, you bring them on the conference line, let them do, you know, you bring them on the conference line, let them sit up there and do uh, the renunciation, and you can be standing there right beside them, and you're going to watch them manifest. You bring them on, take them to John Eckhart Church, and, um, right, they don't want to be delivered. Right. They don't want to be delivered. Take them to John Eckhart Church if you can, or take them to a deliverance church. It, you know, for me, if somebody tells me some stuff like that, I want to invite them to church with me. You know, I, I want to take them to a deliverance church and watch them fall all over the floor and manifest and say, so you still don't believe in it? Yeah, me too. I do regular deliverance on myself. I take myself. If I think I need deliverance, I will go up into that prayer room and I will start renouncing some stuff. I will start binding up some stuff. I will set it on fire. I do a lot of stuff. I'm not going to sit up and be bound. And that's why I said, that's why I said, when I go to that deliverance conference, um, if if they sit up there and say, you, ma'am, come here. We wanna, oh, okay, I ain't going to argue. I'm not going to be ashamed. I'll be sitting up there talking about hitting me. So that's right, stay delivered. And that's how your finances stay good too because y'all have them demons attack folks' finances. That's what they do. Somebody else had a question. I don't remember what that question was. It was something. Um, ask me the question again. Yeah, I'm sorry. We didn't got out the whole de debt deliverance or what have you. But uh, for debt deliverance, I want. how can you tell if someone is blocking your husband? They need too much of your time. They're calling you up for stuff that they shouldn't be calling you for. Just, girl, what you doing? I was at work today and I breathe. Praise God. Girl, what you doing? Um... So I had this thought or what have you. They're just wasting your time. That's a blocker. That's a person that God doesn't want in your life because what that person is doing is just taking up your time. That when you, here's the thing. What if they call you every day and pray? It still could be a blocker because they're just, sometimes people use an excuse to call you. If, you. if they calling you up to pray all the time and then all of a sudden they want to start talking after that, the prayer was just a distraction to get you on the phone. You know, you don't need to be on the phone with nobody to pray for them. You know, some people will tell me, like I had a lady tell me some time ago, 
she actually reached out to me and asked me to pray for her. She needed some major deliverance, but I wasn't in deliverance at that time. But um, she asked me to pray for her. And I told her, I was sitting in front of a big plate of spaghetti I had cooked, and I was ready to eat. And she just called me out the blue. I didn't even know the woman had my number. But um, she wanted me to pray for her. Um, she just started talking, and I told her, I said, well, I'll pray for you later. And she said, well, um, right. Well, even some of them will nurture you and build you up. Some of them do. I've had friends, y'all, that call me up and compliment me every day, but they were wasting my time. And it's kind of like a guy. You know, think about it. I can go out here and marry the wrong man, and he will compliment me every day. He will tell me a lot of stuff. He will say, I love you. You know, you're beautiful to me. I want to spend my life with you. And he'll say all that other stuff, but he's still not the right man. So I've had people to call me up and tell me you anointed um, and all that other stuff. What about the spaghetti? Oh, yeah, the lady was calling me up. Y'all see, I shipped, I'm sorry. But the lady was calling me up, and I was getting ready to eat, and she wanted me to pray with her. And <laughs> I had to think about it for a minute. I almost lost my train of thought. But she wanted me to pray with her, and I told her I was going to pray for her. And I said, um, I'll do it today. And she said, well, can you do it while I'm on the phone? And I told her, I know I'll call you. I, I told her, just know that I'm going to pray for you. She said, but I want to hear it. I said, no, just know that I'll pray for you. People like that, I don't I don't like anybody to ask me for prayer if they don't trust me to pray for them. Because that, that right there is demonic in itself. You know, why you ask me to pray if you want to hear what I'm saying? You know, that means that you think that I'm going to pray something that I shouldn't pray. So then why did you call me? That's the thing. Why did you call me? If you trust me, if you believe that I have the Spirit of God, then I, you don't have to hear me pray. You know, if you believe I got the Spirit of God, then what you'll do is just tell me, hey, Tiff, like, um, there are some people I believe got the Spirit of God. And if I need prayer, I don't have to hear them pray for me. All I do is reach out and say, hey, um, could you pray for me? I may give them the details or I may not give them the details, but I don't need them to pray on, with me on the phone. Some people need that because they don't trust folks. And it's demonic. And half of the time, their, their motives, they didn't call you for prayer. They called you to talk about something else. They called you to waste your time. They called you up to see what you're doing. They're monitoring you. There's a such thing as a demon called a monitoring spirit. It will monitor, they're monitoring you because when you get on the phone, here's what happens. When somebody talks to you, you're going to respond. So you're going to have to turn around and tell them something that they want to hear. So while they're telling you their business, you feel provoked to tell them something about you. So that's how they monitor your life is you're sitting back and you're constantly telling them um, this and that. And I found I, I would have... Um, Things I'm working on and people would actually go to pull it on me. I'm like, how in the world did she know I was working on a book or I was working on this or that? And they'll just start talking on, along the lines of that subject. And then I would feel compelled to tell them, okay, so I'm working on this. And next thing you know, I'm under attack. You know, so I've learned to, you know, like I said, when it comes to friends, I don't do that whole talk every day on the phone. What you doing? How you breathing? You know, how you wearing your hair today, what you wearing to the, the show, I don't do that stuff anymore because half of the time, in my experience, God has delivered me enough from pe that, that same demon in different people to the point where I don't want it. I, I, I love, I right, I don't have time. I love my sisters. I'll tell you the truth. I got friends that they're my sisters in the love and I, in the Lord, and I love them with my whole heart. If a demon is attacking them, they know they can call me. I will be happy to come after that demon with them. I will be happy to set that thing on fire. I will be happy. I'm there for them and all that other stuff, but they don't need to talk to me every day. Yeah, deliverance from people. Because here, here's the thing. You can get delivered from demons and then have people around you who have demons in them. Yeah, what the perfume. But you can, if a demon can't get in you, it'll get around you. That's the thing. If it can't get in you, it will get around you. It will find somebody to get around you in. That's all it has to do is find somebody that you feel the need to talk to. Somebody calling you up every day and they're complimenting you. They're sitting back and they're saying, girl, and I was telling somebody about you today, girl. And this, and it, it's demonic. It's not God. It, it's not God. Nobody, no, nobody needs to talk to me every day except for my God-appointed husband, my mama, and more than anything, my God. That's all. I don't need to talk to people on the phone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They don't need to know 
what I'm doing or what I'm cooking and all that other stuff. My husband, yes, of course, you know, you, he, he in the house with you. And if he goes out of town, you're going to want to talk to him. But when it comes to friends and all that other stuff, no, those are monitoring spirits. Those are monitoring spirits. And this is the type of stuff that God wants to be taught in the body of Christ. No, yeah, don't answer. Um, the way that God set me free was when I talked to people, I had to let the sin die. And then, too, sometimes people will basically be, really, they need validation, especially when you say you're Christian. They want validation for what they're doing. So if they're gossiping, stop gossiping with them. Don't gossip. You shouldn't be gossiping anyway because the spirit attached to gossip. But if they're gossiping, don't gossip with them. If they're complaining, don't let them complain in your ear. Tell them, say, hey, I'm not going to sit here and listen to you complain. I love you. You know, we're going to talk about God. We're going to live up the name of the Lord. If they're listening to music that is on the of the Lord, girl, check out this song. I don't listen to that stuff anymore. Whatever sin that you're a part of, that's what's going to attract them to you. That's what's going to bring them into your life. So you let that die. And what I learned to start doing with uh, my friends, if they come. Okay, I'm going to let y'all come back in. We're going to do this real quick and then we're going to close out because it looks like they want to kick me out of here. And we'll do it again uh, soon, guys. We'll do it again soon. Um, I wanted to go ahead and break the ground and go ahead and do Periscope because I've been planning to do it for a long time. But Amen. So uh, this is what happens, y'all. Um, after this, I'm going to take about two more questions, two or three more questions, and then we'll close. But um, this is what happens when you stop giving people the ability to take up your time, to waste your time. When you stop giving people, and it, it starts with self. It don't start with them. Um, God bless you, sis. Hey, I love you, sis. But when you stop letting people waste your time, when you stop letting people take, you know, all of your time, then God will deliver you, huh? Yeah, that, yeah that's what I'm going to go off to. When you stop allowing people to waste your time, they'll go away from you because when you're dealing with a time waster, a time waster needs somebody's time to waste. They got to waste somebody's time. They, they, they're dependent and they need somebody to talk to. They need that all the time. So what I started doing with my friends was I didn't answer their calls. Um, they had schedules. I noticed that um, one of them, well, a couple of them, they would call me when they were in traffic. they get off work and they had a commute home. And they would call me during the commute. I wouldn't answer the phone during that commute. You're going to have to get over it. You're going to have to drive and talk to the Lord. You don't need to talk to me. But I stopped answering their phones during their commutes. Um, I will call them back later to see if something was wrong. I shortened the conversation. I would pray before I even called them back. And I would say, God, you know, I don't want to have that dependency. Um, I, I, I don't want to have any dependency. Just use me or what have you. And I get on the phone and not if they're not talking about anything, if it's clear they didn't want anything, I said, well, I would just give you a call back, but I'm, I got to go. I get off the phone because what I'm doing is I'm saying that I'm not going to let you waste my time. Even though I may be bored and I may not have anything to do, I can find something to do. But the thing is, I don't want to use my time on the phone talking about nothing when I can be building, I can be creating something. Half of you got books in you that you're not even writing yet. But you spend more time talking to your friends than you do doing anything for God or talking to God. And one thing I've learned is if you spend more time talking to one person than you do to God, you are, you are in error. Only time it's okay to talk to people um, a lot is if that's your job and you get paid for it. You know, if you're working in a marketplace or something, you, nobody should have that much of your time. Nobody should have that much of you but your husband. So you don't want to spend so much time because... I'll tell you this, what God taught me. Half of the women, like, this is why I had to stop it. Half of the women who were reaching out to me were commuters. And I want y'all to remember that term. It's called a commuter. A commuter is basically, what they do is they're commuting. They want a man. They want a husband. They're single. Most of them are single. They want a man. So they call up and they get a bunch of sing single female friends. They're in traffic. Yep. They get a, a bunch of female friends, and what they do is they will call you up because they have nothing else to do. The time, the, the, the way that they want to spend, God or dang boyfriend, take up your time. 
I talked to a guy, um, but the time of it that's available to the guy is going to depend on the rank that he is, you know. If he's just a boyfriend, then I wouldn't let him take too much of my time. You know, we just courting. But um, when you're dealing with people, you have to make sure that your time is, is, is given to God and not to people. You don't want to spend so much of your time with people. Because during that time, you don't know what you need deliverance from. During that time, you spend a lot of time sinning. The Bible says that in the, um, in the multitude of words, sin is not absent. So when you talk to somebody a lot, sin is going to be present. You're going to have a lot of sin in the midst of that conversation. Y'all going to gossip. Y'all going to laugh at somebody. Y'all going to say something you shouldn't have said. Don't, don't spend that, that type of time with people. That's, that's a dependency. It's a codependency. And like I said, half of the time is demonic. So what you have to do is you got to get rid of the commuter friends. A commuter friend is like this. And I've had quite a few commuter friends in my life. A commuter friend is like this. They call you up every day. They spend your time. They waste your time or what have you. A man comes into their life, they call, you, they call you, they spend your time, but the minute they think that that man is locked in, they think that they don't need you, they'll, you're not going to hear from them anymore. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You're not going to hear from them anymore, or they'll find some type of reason or some type of way to justify, um, huh? yeah, no, that's right. But no, what they do is they'll spend your time, and it's because they want a man. They want a man, they want somebody to talk to, and they want somebody to talk to about getting a man. That's it. They want to spend, oh, girl, I'm waiting on my husband, me too. They just sitting back, and you, yeah, you become a placeholder, and what have you, until he comes along. And then when he comes along, then they're going to push you out to the side, or what have you. And then that's that. And then if you, if you rebuke them for anything they do with him, they say, you're jealous, you're this and you're that. And then as soon as that relationship ends with, them, with him, they come running back, girl, yeah, you know he this and he that. Yeah, they want a man more than they want God. They really do. And those are commuters. So those type of people, I've had them since I was in high school. I've had those type of friends since I was in high school. It took me to get into my, all the way up into my 30s. You know, like I said, I'm on my last year of my 30s right now. But um, it took me to get to this place to honestly, to be able to identify what that was. And, you know, to be able to say, this person is not in my life because she loves having uh, conversations with me or spending time with me. This woman is in my life because she's bored. Yeah, Christians, but you know Christians need deliverance too. That's the thing. Christians need deliverance too. But she's in my life because she's bored. She needs she need somebody to talk to. She needs something to do. So that's why she's calling me up on the phone. She's not calling me because she loves me. She's not calling me because she's concerned about me. She's calling because she's bored. And I'm talking to her because I'm bored. So we bought two bored souls on the phone. So for me, listen up, y'all. Yeah, boredom and loneliness. But um, if they like being in your life, but they still call you every day, yeah, it's still error because that's too much of your time. Your time is your most valuable asset. That's why uh, the companies pay you for it. They don't just pay you to show up in the office. They pay you for your time. They, they pay you for your time. So... Yeah, well, well, I'll talk to you about that in a second. But um, people pay you for your time. That's the most valuable asset that you have is your time. So that's why I can honestly tell you, y'all, God has blessed me with several businesses. That's why the enemy always tries to find people to waste my time. It's because I'm writing, I'm busy, I'm building. You, you write, you can never get time back. I'm building. So the enemy is always looking for somebody to waste my time. That way I can't build, I can't write, I can't create because I'm in the midst of somebody. That's why, too, when people reach out to me and they say, um, can we talk? And they send me their phone. I'm about, oh, no, you, you do the Ask Tiffany thing. Whenever I get a time, I, because the thing is, you can end up in a, in a, a relationship, a friendship, where somebody's wasting your time. And if it, they see, the person doesn't know that they need deliverance. All they know is that they want somebody to talk to. And they're bored. That's all they, that's all they know. And when you avail yourself to them, then... That's right. But when you when you avail yourself to them, they become dependent on you, and then it becomes a thing where you're supposed to answer my call. I had a friend some years ago. If I didn't answer her call, she wouldn't she wouldn't be mean. She would be passive aggressive with rebuking me for not answering her call. She'll say, "I called you, and you didn't even answer your phone, girl. I be want to come over there and do something to you." But that was being passive aggressive. Yeah, 
that is it is in an hour's time i can write probably five pages in a book that's time that i can do something right but it the enemy listen ladies i want you to hear me on this he didn't just send guys to block women he sends women to block women the thing is a woman who's bored who doesn't know her purpose doesn't know her identity doesn't know um who she is in christ jesus a woman who's not content who feels like she needs to have people around her that woman is already demonically bound and the enemy is going to send somebody to block her time and never let her find out her identity and oh yeah most of the girl what i'm talking about i got delivered i got delivered from christian women i got delivered from christian women it wasn't these weren't pagan women i don't deal with um worldly women i minister to them but i don't deal with them like that it's, it's christian women yeah they holy spirit feel yeah yeah they they need deliverance they need deliverance some of them are dependent some of them they they, they come out of one friendship and go to the next they come out of the next friendship and go to the next they need somebody to talk to if if i avail myself y'all i'm gonna tell you right now if i availed myself I would have about 15 women calling me every day and every last one of them would want a minimum hour of my time. Yeah, majority is Christian women. Majority is. It, the time wasters that God has had to deliver me from for, were Christian women. The, the ones that he's had to do, they were Christian women. And they needed deliverance. And I didn't know it at the time, but they needed deliverance. They were Christian women. And they were wasting my time. They weren't busy in their purpose. That's the thing about a time waster is most of the time they're not busy. They're not doing anything. They're sitting around waiting on God to send them a man. And that brings me to the question for the uh, the lady that asked, um, you said pray for God to send a God-ordained husband. Um, the thing about the whole God-ordained husband thing is it, become, it can become idolatry. I never pray for somebody to get their husband. I always pray for somebody to get in line with Christ Jesus because if you're in line with Christ Jesus, you'll get your husband. If you're in the will of God, you'll get your husband. If you surrender to God, you'll get your husband because he's going to find you when you become a good thing in the Lord. So that means a good thing can't be outside of the Lord. You have to be a good thing in the Lord. God has to declare you a wife. You have to be hidden. That means that I can't be on social media liking every guy's cute guy status and sharing my picture on his wall and doing all kinds of stuff i can't be spending my time trying to get a man's attention because at the end of the day i might get his attention that ain't a good thing because if he's not my husband and i get his attention then i've worked to get him which means that the investment that i've made trying to capture him is going to be too it'll be hard for me to let him go because i made an investment so the thing is i'm not going to waste my time yeah, because here's the thing. The marketplace for single women, if I wanted to be a millionaire or a billionaire right now, I could be. Because the marketplace for single women, I tell you, single Christian women who want a husband and single women, that's why people like Steve Harvey come out with these books. You know, act like a, act like a lady but think like a man. I can write, um, I can write probably, I can average about four books a month if I wanted to. I can write four books and deceive people if I wanted to. I fear God too much to do anything like that. But that marketplace is banging because a lot of women want a man more than they want a, a husband. Excuse me, want more than they want God. That's the error. And the reason that a lot of women are like that, can y'all hear me for a minute? The reason is because half of them are still soul tied to somebody else. If you got a soul tie... Your soul recognizes that you're married. Soul tie is nothing but you being married to somebody. You know, um, especially if it's a sexual soul tie, it's marriage. Believe it or not, you read the Bible. I want y'all to take some time out to find out, you know, what marriage is in God's sight. God is not marriage. We have a traditional marriage. Going to the altar and saying I do is traditional. That is not in the Bible. It is not the when I stand at the altar next to a man and say, I do, that is tradition. That was not how they got married in the Bible. Do y'all know how they got married? A man went to um, his father-in-law's house or his dad went and they arranged a marriage. The You may have two families. So what happens is you got 
this family over here who says, I want my son to marry your daughter. And this family agrees. They enter the equivalent of what's called a contract. I'm going to get to the comments in a minute, y'all, so I won't get distracted. But they entered the equivalent of what's called a contract, a contractual agreement. They agreed upon the day. They agreed upon the time. They did not have a wedding ceremony. Do you know how they got married? The man went to the bride's house on the day of the marriage. They had a room called a chopper room. He went into the room and he had sex with his virgin bride. And that's what married them. There were witnesses outside the room. There were witnesses outside the room. The dad gave them a white cloth. It was called a purity cloth. She had to lay on a purity cloth because when the hymen broken, blood was to be shed. So the cloth was given, yeah, it was given by the dad. And then they had to give the cloth back to the dad. Um, or the, the, the bride could keep it or the dad would keep. So the blood was on the cloth that proved her virginity, that proved that she was not um, she was not married to somebody else. In God's eyes, marriage starts the minute you have sex with somebody. That it is not that was that's what made that man a husband was because he had an agreement. Well, the the husband part started because they had sex. However, um, oh, you don't have to try to make a prophecy come to pass. You just need to obey God, and it comes to pass automatically. But the thing was, they went into a room that had sex, and that was it. He came out of the room, then they went and had a, um, they had what we call a reception. They had a reception then. So that was it. So that's why in the Bible they say, should I go and make my, myself one with a harlot? God forbid. What they're saying, you make yourself one, you become one with everybody you have sex with. If you have not repented, you are still married to every man you've ever had sex with. If you haven't repented for it and renounced the soul tie, you're still married in God's eyes. That's why when people, it's Ill, you're right, it's married, but it's an illegal marriage. If there was no bear, if there was no blood, then um, no, he could, he had to because he had sex with her, he had to still stick with her. But what would happen was um, the witnesses would have to stand in agreement. Most of the time, you know, they would just understand that you know all women are different or what have you, and the witnesses would vouch for her that she was pure and nobody ever touched her or what have you, and that was it. So um, he couldn't just get out of it. He couldn't get out of it. But the thing is, marriage is established through sex. Marriage is not established at the altar. That's why in a lot of states, in the United States, do you know you can get drunk and marry somebody and wake up and get an annulment if you did not consummate the marriage? If you did not consummate, if you, had, you didn't have sex with them, if you, if, then it was considered, what about Mary and Joseph? Well, that was called an arranged marriage. Um, what they, betrothment was the equivalent of marriage. So they considered you a wife the minute the contractual agreement was um, established. As a matter of fact, you could still be stoned and not have had an official marriage. You could be stoned. If you were supposed to be marrying one man and you went out and had sex with another man, you could be stoned back then for that because you were considered that man's wife. So that's just what we do now is traditional marriage. Ill, what makes marriage legal and illegal is... If a man wants to marry you, then to make it legal, he had, well, back in the day, in the Bible times, he had to go to your father. Here it is now, y'all. I love how God works. He had to go to your father. In order to marry you, your, he had to go to your father and ask for your hand. Okay, so we know we're no longer in Old Testament. When a man wants to marry you, he needs to go to your father in Christ Jesus. He needs to go to your father. Your father has to give you away. Your father back then, the man in the Old Testament, the father had to give the woman away. God has to give you away. When, and we do, in our traditional marriage, it's funny, we try to do something where the dad walks us down the aisle and he does what? He gives us away, right? That's, the dad walks you down the aisle. So, right, he has to have a relationship with God. God has to give you away. If you get married to a man that God has not given you to, even if he's Christian, because he can be Christian and God did not permit it. If you get married to a man that God has not given you to, your marriage is considered illegal, but it is still a marriage. 
it's still a marriage. So now you got to go through a whole system. You got to sit there and stay married to the guy. Listen, guys, I was married the second time when God woke me up. Like, for real, woke me up. When I stopped playing Christian, I stopped trying to be, I stopped having a Christian experience and I started having a Christ experience when I was married. I was married in that first year and I tell people it was like I woke up one day and everything was different. And even though I repented, repentance does not take the consequence away. I, I repented, but when I looked next to me, the man was still laying there. Repentance didn't make him go away. So I still had to deal with it. And then I had to go through a process. God started telling me how to be married to the man. And I didn't want, I, I was telling God, and being honest, I was telling God I wanted out. You know, because I knew I deserved better. That's one thing about marriage is that a lot of people want to get married. They don't realize that how hard it is to stay married. Your emotions are going to still be involved. You're not going to be sitting up in there like, well, I'm married now. So let no, you, you can get to a point where you want out. You can get to the point. And I got, I got to that point in the first year of that marriage. I was at that point where I was begging God to let me out of that marriage. I was begging I kept trying to leave. I was trying to arrange to leave. I, I wanted out of that marriage. And the reason was, was because I recognized that I wasn't loved. God said, no, that's right. I identified it. I could not lie to myself anymore. I couldn't say that that man loved me. I sat back and I said, this man does not love me. I told myself the truth. God opened my eyes and God dealt with me. He said, God is love. This man don't have Christ. So because he don't have Christ, he can't love you. I recognize that I didn't have love. So I'll tell you what that's like. I tell women, and you know, with him, he got saved right when we were going through a divorce. Praise God. Um, God, you bless me. Yeah, I had to submit to him. God made me submit to that man. God started taking me through a process, and I had to submit. And I tell you, this is the reason why I'm passionate. Like if a guy comes to me, and he's trying to get with me, and he's not my husband, I, 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 no, 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 no. I'll send them away quick. I got an experience that a lot of single women have never had, and this is something I warn women about. I had ended up getting experience, uh, an experience where I wanted to be out of that marriage more than half of the mar uh, single women wanted to be in a marriage. I wanted out. I was begging and praying and fasting and crying. I wanted out. And God told me, no, it doesn't work like that. You chose him. It doesn't matter. Well, God, we are equally yoked. God said, it doesn't matter. That's your husband. Now you chose him. So I had to stay there in that marriage and endure. I cried like a baby. I begged God. I y'all, I threw so many temper tantrums before the Lord, it wasn't even funny. I, I I mean, I was throwing temper. I didn't even realize I was still a baby until I found myself having a temper tantrum. I threw so many temper tantrums, like get me out. I want, because the thing is, if you get married and you're not loved, then you're still not going to be happy. The happiness starts outside the marriage. It, it doesn't start in the marriage. It actually starts on the outside. So I, I was crying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you heard my testimony. Um, there was one time when I went on the floor and laid there and screamed into the carpet. And I screamed like a baby. <laughs> Just screaming, crying. I was so hurt. And God asked me, he said, are you finished yet? And I'll never forget, y'all. I looked up and I looked around like, uh, really? I'm thinking God's going to comfort me. I'm thinking he's going to see how broken it is. So any woman who's ever been married, this is, this is something that women need to testify about. Here's what happens if you get married to the wrong man. He's not going to love you. There is a secret to you. You're not, you can't give it to him. You can try. You can talk to him all day. He can't hear you. You can tell him, I'm this and I'm that and I'm this and I like this and he can't hear you. He, he only thing he's going to do is identify what he sees, what God allows him to see. He can't hear you, which means he can't fulfill you. He can't make you happy. He doesn't know how to. And then to, to make it worse is in the midst of all that, you're not loved, you're not appreciated, you're not understood. But then this man expects you to submit sexually to him. So now you feel raped. That's what happens when you marry the wrong man. You're not happy. You you end up in a in a situation where you're not happy, but you're supposed to do everything that a wife does. If he gets saved, he can get saved, but still he has to go through a process. You know, saved don't mean delivered. 
You know, um, if he gets saved, that's the beautiful thing. That's the process. He he got he needs to get filled with the Holy Spirit. He needs to go through deliverance and he needs to go through some stuff. And this is something I tell people all the time. Do you know that the man that you marry, if you go out there and get a man who's not in Christ Jesus, do you know that um you can get with this guy and that man turn around and get saved and delivered and don't want you no more? Because what was in him, it was a demon in him that was assigned him to you that made him want you in the first place. So you want somebody who's delivered and wants you. You don't want somebody who ain't delivered and wants you. Because half of the time, what's in him wants you. It ain't him that wants you. It's what's in him that wants you. So it, you it, sometimes demons attract certain types of demons. Demons like to go and network, y'all. There are certain types of demons that are attracted to certain types of demons. You can take... Have you ever noticed... You, you ever got that... Um, That's right. Have you ever noticed that you ever seen somebody that was real jacked up and it don't matter where you take them, they're going to always find somebody as jacked up as they are. You ever notice those type of people, they attract, demons attract demons. So there are certain demons that are attracted to each other. So when you, you, you sit up here, if you're not delivered, you're going to attract a certain type of spirit. And that man comes to you and he's attracted to you. And sometimes it could be, if you, if you seductive, Right. If you're seductive, it can be perversion in him that attracts him to the seduction in you. So he gets married to you because you what you call a freak. You're, you're seductive. So he, he gets married to you because what's in him want what's in you. So basically what y'all have is a bunch of demons coming, coming together. Now you get saved and sanctified and you start getting delivered and that seductors get cast out of you. That man will lose interest because what's on the inside of him doesn't have anything to feed on. It's the whole thing of, like I said, you got roaches. If you feed the roaches, when you talk about friends, if you feed the roaches, then you get, if they got something to feed on, they're going to feed. You can get married to somebody and end up getting delivered. And then at, once you get delivered, the man has to leave because there is nothing there for him to feed on anymore. There is nothing in you for him to feed on. Uh, that's what happens to a lot of marriages. That's why you hear, have people say we grew apart. They're not lying. They actually did grow apart. What happens is the one of the people get delivered and the other person is no longer being fed. So the other person keeps trying to communicate with them at the level that they, they were once on and they can't reach each other. So you got two different people in two different places. Yeah, it's the same thing in workplace, but you got two different people on two different in two different places. And when you got people in different places, that's what happens. People are going to sit back and you're in a house and I went through that when I was married the, the second time. We were on completely two completely different levels. Um, he would be in the house on his computer reading something, and I'd be in the house doing something else. You know, the only time we try to communicate with each other we could, we would have a weekly date, which was my request because I always, if I'm married, I always say, you know, take me out at least once a week. You know, let me get dressed up so we can go somewhere at least once a week. I don't want to just sit in the house or what have you. So, um... What ended up happening was we would go out to eat and we wouldn't have anything to talk about. I'm trying to talk about Christ. I'm trying to talk about baby God bless me to do this and all that other stuff. And he wanted to talk about people because that's where he was. Not to say he was bad. It's just to say um, there is nothing for us to communicate about. We're just there. So that's why you see some people, they get married and that, their whole relationship is centered around sex. And then eventually that's going to blow out because the thing is women, we're emotional creatures. So a man has to first make love to a woman's mind before her body even wants him. You know, so at, at, at some point, eventually, he, you know, there's no work, no communication. And so she's not going to be interested in him physically. And right. That's right. You spend the majority of your time standing up. You gonna spend, you're not going to have a, a sexual relationship with your husband. A lot of people are used to having sexual relationships with men. So they come together and everything, they got all this great chemistry because they don't live together. But um, when you get married, you communicate. You're talking. He's having to get to know you. And y'all, it's telling me that my battery is low, so I'm going to ready to go. Um, but he's having to get to know you and you're having to get to know him. That's what marriage is. Y'all are talking all the time. Y'all got to y'all gotta be friends, which means that Y'all have to be at the place where y'all can communicate. Y'all have to be able to talk. Y'all got to be able to talk about, um, oh, thank you. I love y'all. But y'all have to be able, you have to be at the place where you're able to talk, really. You got to be at the place where y'all are best friends. You got to be at the place where 
you're not just sitting there and um you're not just sitting there and wasting each other's time you know because what ends up happening if you get married and y'all are not assigned to each other all you're gonna do is um try to have a sexual relationship with a husband and it's not gonna work and he's gonna start feeling lonely in his house you're gonna feel lonely in your own house and then y'all will be mad at each other for making each other feel like that you know so it's gonna boil down to that so the best thing to do uh, honestly when it comes to wanting a husband ladies best thing to do like i said we, if you just join in best thing to do be yourself this your face whatever your face is embrace it embrace your face embrace your personality kill the credit don't get any any credit embrace yourself all together just let just let god work and if you don't believe what i'm telling you take this broadcast to any man and i guarantee you he's gonna tell you i know what i'm talking about no man wants a woman listen up no man wants a woman who doesn't know how to be herself just be you. That's it. You be you be you. Love you. Get to get to embrace the girl in the mirror. You don't have to go and um, I know we talked about the blonde hair and all that other stuff. You don't have to go and blonde your hair and put you know you don't have to draw a cross on your forehead and wear them big old eyebrows. You don't have to do all that stuff to your face. You don't have to do that. All you gotta do is just be you. That's it. Any man who rejects me for being me was not assigned to me anyway. So listen, I don't want him. I don't want him anyway. Because he's not assigned to me. He's not assigned to my life. So why would I want a man that I got to constantly compete for? Why do, I don't want him anyway. I want somebody who God has seen, who sees the value in me. That's it. Because this is what I learned when I was married. And it was funny. I was married the first time I was a diva. You know, size four and all. I was married the first time. I would not let that man see my natural hair. I wouldn't let him see me without contact lenses. I wouldn't let him see me, and that was not love. That was me being in bondage and being afraid that he wouldn't love me as God has created me. Afraid that he would he would reject me. That wasn't love. When I got married again, I was past that point. I was just like, look, hey, here go my hair. I'm not gonna put on. I'm not gonna do. Thank you, sis. Thank you. But I stopped trying to be somebody else. I stopped allowing the television to tell me how I ought to look. And I just started embracing Tiffany. I embrace Tiffany. I love Tiffany. And when I go places today, listen, guys pass me. I don't care. That don't bother me anymore. A man can pass me and I can look and think of myself that he's handsome. He can pass me by. It doesn't bother me anymore. Ladies, let me tell you why. Because if he can't see me, he's not assigned to me. He wouldn't be able to cover me anyway. Hey, I'd have been married to, you know, you what we would call fine. And you can be married to somebody who's fine, who can't see you. So you you living in an experience that um that you don't want, most people don't want. So I want something greater than that. I, I don't I don't want somebody just in my life. I want somebody who understands Tiffany. I want Mr. Goddardain who can say, I know my wife. I know, and I can say I know him. I'm not worried about where he, you know, if he walk out the door, I'm not scared that he going over to somebody's house. If he, if he, if I lay my phone around, he's not afraid. That's right. You stay hidden. When I stay hidden, when I don't, I don't intentionally try to make myself uh, seen by guys. I, I stay away from that because it's a waste of time. Ladies, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. When I tried to be seen, I kept being seen, and a lot of guys kept, hey, I, I want you. And we, we run off into a relationship and everything, and then the next thing you know, it didn't work, and then I'm back out trying to be seen, and somebody else see me, and they say, yeah. After, after a while, you get tired of being passed around like a cigarette. After a while, you get tired of that. So when God dealt with me, when God changed me, when I began to love God more, I want the love of God. So if... I mean, me, for example, I want to be married. I look forward to that day, but I want the love of God more than I want the love of a man. I'll tell you the truth. You know, some people will say, well, that ain't me. Well, that's me. I want the love of God more than I want the love of a man. And the reason is, is because I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I've experienced his love and I realize I need it. I need his love. It, it makes me whole. It makes me happy. It makes me complete. You know, so when it comes to a man, I'm satisfied and I'm happy before he meets me. I don't need him to come in and make me happy. I don't need him to come in and make me pure. I just need him 
to come in and take his place as a husband. And that way I can submit to him without struggling. Because here's what happens. And I, we're going to close after this. Here's what happens. If you get with a man who is who can't lead you. you All right, y'all. We're going to let some uh, people come back in. I, I saw somebody said that's a bit much. You know, some people, sometimes y'all, sometimes people say it don't take all that. I'm going to tell you, I've had, I want to tell you, I've had a Christ experience. I've had a Christ experience, not a Christian experience. Too many people are having Christian experiences. Yes, it takes all that. And some. It takes all that. I got rid of the furniture. Because here's the thing. When it comes to, like, couch, it comes to bed, most of the time y'all having sex on that stuff. That Don't no man want to come and sit on the furniture that you have with another dude. Ask any man that. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants, and then half of the time, women stay so tired because they got memories out. They got, praise God, women got memories all around their house. They can't get, they can't get free because they got memories everywhere. I remember when we bought that couch when we went. The devil is a lie. That crap getting up out of my house. When I, when I went through the divorce, when I went through that divorce, I called my ex. You know what? We had to communicate. What have you? I told him. I said, Hey, look, I'm about to get rid of this couch. You want it? You want the computer chair? You want this? I gave all that stuff. I let him take everything he wanted to get. That's right. Underwear, everything. Everything he wanted. You want to come get it? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it away. I didn't even sell the stuff. I was giving stuff away. I got rid of the mattresses. Um, because here's the thing. The mattresses, DNA. That's the thing. You, nobody wants to come. And I'm sorry. I, I, I don't even think I can respect a man that would want to sit on another man's furniture. Yeah, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't respect a man to sit on another man's furniture. I'm sorry. Because I'm used to dealing with a man who knows how to be like a man. I don't, I don't want no passive, scary, can't cover nobody type dude. Huh? Tell your husband that left, that you still love him. If he's still your husband and you still love him, yes. Um, but if God delivered you from him, let that man go. You, you let the love transition. You never stop. Loving Loving doesn't stop you. The love transitions. It goes from, like for example, my exes, I pray for them for their deliverance and all that other stuff. My love for them is not romantic anymore. It, I let that love die. Eros had to go. Um, so the love that I have is friendly, is brotherly love. Is I want them to say, I want them saved. And all that other stuff. I want them saved and delivered, and I want them to be happy and all that other stuff. But as the the eros, you don't continue to have that for somebody, um, because you know you can't get a God ain't gonna send another husband in. You can't have eros for two men. You can't have eros for two men. You gotta have eros for one guy, and you reserve that. Eros is romantic, but. You need to have agape before you have eros. You got to have unconditional love before you have eros. You can't wash furniture with the blood of Jesus. No. You can't wash furniture with the blood of Jesus. You think about it this way. Um, they got idols. I mean, you have um, altars that people had. And they were sacrificed to other gods on those altars. Do you think that we can wipe the altar off and anoint it and God will accept it? No. No. And look, I'm going to tell you something. I've told women this. I've told women, some of y'all listen something. Um, I've told women, I said, get rid of the furniture. I've had women, I've had two types of women since I've told that. I've had women who said they couldn't afford to, and they kept it, and they said, well, I'm just waiting to get some money so I can afford to. They never got the money to get the new furniture because God doesn't give you the money until you obey him. The, the women that, every woman that has reached out to me that got rid of her furniture, God gave her supernatural money to get new furniture. God gave her the money. She went through a season probably without having a bed. She didn't care. She got her an air mattress and she kept her peace because you know what? She wanted her freedom. So it take all that and some. If you want to be free, it take all that and some. If you don't want to have the, like, I don't want no soul ties, no ungodly soul ties. I don't want any romantic soul ties. And I, I'm being honest, y'all. I'm being open. I'm, I'm being really transparent. Um, excuse me. I don't like to be. But I'm being open and honest. I don't want any soul ties. I don't want anything that blocks. Not just my God-appointed husband, 
but I don't want anything in my house that that brings back memories. I don't want anything that makes it hard for me to move past. I got past. Um, thank you, amen. So I couldn't stop thinking of the guy I let go as soon as I threw all the stuff away. I, I didn't think of him anymore. A lot of, no, not married yet, sis. But um, this is the thing that I, listen, I went through a process. I was going through a divorce. I was going through a healing process, but I was getting rid of stuff. I walked into a furniture store randomly. Hey, I need new mattresses. And the guy was laughing at me, but I went in there and I'm like, I want y'all to come get the old mattress I got and come bring me some new ones. And I, I went around and I prayed first. God kept telling me what to do. He even told me to get rid of the comforter. I was listening. That's, that's the thing. Some people have a Christian experience. Some people have a Christ experience. I had a Christ experience. In my, in my Christ experience, the Lord was telling me to get rid of this, get rid of that. He's been dealing with me about, look, he's been dealing with me about getting rid of this stand. I'm going to get rid of it. Um, there, There's a TV stand. I'm going to get rid of it. It's got to go. That's the only thing I think I got left is a TV stand. I got rid of all that stuff. I'm not going to sit up here and have, um, I was married, the first time I was married, I was married seven years, and the second time, five years. Yep, seven. Perfect number of completion. Yeah, but the, the thing is, like I said, I had a lot of experiences in life, and a lot of Christians I come in contact with, they got Christian experiences, and they're too busy, they keep on having these Christian experiences. And they don't have any that many Christ experiences. And that's why when I testify, people are wow. I'm having a lot of Christ experiences because I do drastic things to get free, to stay free, to, to experience God. I do drastic things. That's right. You can always buy another one. That I do drastic things. I, I'm radical with it. That's right. I don't I don't waste my time trying to question God. If God, when God told me to get rid of my couch, I did it. I got up. Listen, y'all, let me tell you how I got rid of my couch. I got up. I put my dog in the car. He wanted to come with me. We drove down to a furniture store. It was the cool of the evening. I said, I'll be right back. I was in that furniture store five minutes. I walked around, found the couch, said, I want that one right there. Went to the register, paid for it, gave him my address, went back out there, went, got me something to eat, went home. I'm not going to, that's the thing. That's when I get the couch, I think, in 2000 early 2015 or 2014 but the Lord no 2014 the Lord told me to get rid of that couch I didn't waste any time a lot of people end up um that's right that's right I, I didn't give away so much stuff and I tell you I, if, if I had somebody that was living near me when I was giving stuff away they were happy matter of fact I did have a friend who was living near me and I gave her so much stuff she was like my god I was just getting I'm getting look some folk, like I said, some people say it don't take all that and they have a Christian experience. I say it does take all that and I have a Christ experience because God has, God has blessed me, y'all. He has blessed me. He gave me back everything I had plus some. He gave me new furniture, new everything. Ain't no DNA but my DNA on my furniture and that come from me salivating going to sleep. That's it. Nobody's DNA is on my furniture. You know, it, it, it takes all that. That's right. It takes all that. And anytime I come in contact with a woman who said, well, I, I'm still trying to get rid of the mattress, but I haven't gotten the money yet. I catch her years later. Did you ever get rid of that mattress? Girl, no. Because she didn't obey God. But when I come across the woman that says, girl, I took that thing and I dragged it to the side of the road. And a week later, somebody turned around and gave me $300 or $500. I went down there and got me a mattress. I went, right, sleep on the floor, sleep on the air mattress. If, if it takes up, whatever it takes for you to get free. That's why half of these folks be sitting up there still obsessed with their ex-boyfriend and calling on God, talking about some God, send me a husband. And God looking at him and he said, you already married. You, y'all just separated. You, I mean, you, you, you're already in a relationship with somebody. You, you just separated. You're already married. You can't ask God for a husband if you got one. So whatever it takes, whatever it takes, ladies do it. Whatever it takes, be drastic, be radical, be bold. And, you know, you can go find some people and get around them and they'll tell you it don't take all that or what have you. Yep. I went to, um, I don't think it was Goodwill, Salvation Army with a car, my, my car, my front seat and my back seat were black with garbage bags and clothes. I got rid of stuff. We went on dates in. I'm not playing. I'm gone. I, I got rid of stuff. 
I'm not entertaining no, I, I wasn't going to entertain any reconciliation ideas. I wasn't going to entertain anything. I told myself the truth. I said, you got to go through the deliverance from the soul tie. You got, you, you got to make sure you forgive this guy. And you got to go through the healing process. Whenever you need to cry, you cry. Whatever you need to do, if you need to write a note, you write a note. I've been in my single season since the end of 2013. The end of 2013. And I'm single and happy. I'm happier than I've ever been in any marriage. Believe it or not, I'm, I'm actually happier, ladies, than I've ever been in any marriage. I have peace now because I have Christ. And he's given me such a, a wonderful experience. I tell y'all, God takes me on dates. You know, he'll tell me, let's go here. He'll say, go here, go there, what have you. I, I'm happy now. I don't have, I'm not worried about anybody. And then you know what makes it so great is not only am I happy now, but I'm, I know God has sent prophets and he's told me about my God appointed husband. He sent prophets to tell me about my husband. And um, I'm, I'm excited about him, the man that God has reserved because I'm the old girl is dead. She died and I'm no longer that girl who needs a man or wants a man. I'm the girl who's just happy. And when God sends my husband, hey, praise God. Yes. When he sends him, that's good. And but I'm happy now. I'm happy. I don't I don't need a man to make me happy. That's why I, uh, every man who's attempted to come in my life did not last three days. You know, anytime if you know in the beginning you don't know, for the most part, most of the guys since my single season, um, that tried to come in within 24 hours, I was like, you are not my husband. And I go. Because I've been married before. And I know what it's like. A lot of people who hold on to guys and they're just like, well, let's just see. It's because they ain't been married before. Get married and get married to the wrong dude. It's going to change your whole life. You, you'll be sitting up in there. I'm telling you, after God get through with you, you, you won't wait. Um, that's right, waiting on my eyes. You, you, you won't waste your time with a man. And then you get in your, look, you get past 35, you ain't got time for that mess no more. I'm sorry. I, you don't have time for that mess. You get 35 and over, and you get in Christ Jesus, and you done had some experiences. You are, look, I don't have time. I'm not going to waste my time talking to somebody's son who's not assigned to me. Because it makes no sense for me to criticize the man when he wasn't assigned to me in the first place. It makes no sense for me to be mad at him. That I need to be mad at me if I let him in. So, mm-hmm. Nope. He, guys come to me and they say, hey, I, I want to get to know you. That, that That's cute. That's cute. But I'm not, uh-uh, no. I, I, I'm learning. I've been married before, ladies. I know what it feels like to be married and desperate to get out of a marriage. Thank you. God bless you, sis. I know what it feels like to be desperate to come out of a marriage. I know what it feels like to, honestly, there were times where I felt like I would rather be in heaven than to be in that marriage. I felt like I didn't want to be because I was. it was so hard. It was so difficult. And it wasn't that I was doing anything wrong. It was because I was married and I knew I wasn't loved. So, the, and I was married and the man wasn't in Christ. So, I, I got to a point where it was hard. No, yeah, sometimes, like when I was married, God wouldn't let me walk out. I tried to leave that man plenty of times. I packed my bags and everything, and God wouldn't let me leave him. God had, God waited. Amen, amen. Let me tell you what God did. When I was married the second time, I had grew up. I had matured in Christ and everything. Um, in the first year of that marriage, God took me through a process. And I, I still tried to leave the guy. I tried, you know, and I didn't realize it back then, but I was trying to escape. You know, there's a difference between leaving and escaping. And I was trying to escape. I was looking for any window, any door, any peephole, any rat hole, anything I can get out of. I was trying to get out. And um, one particular day, you know, and I didn't realize what God was doing. For those of you who were married, I didn't know what he was doing. Because I was a believer and my husband wasn't a believer. I didn't realize what I was doing. And I had been praying and crying and praying and crying and just begging God. And let me tell you what he did. I, a week before me and my ex broke up officially, I packed my suitcases. I packed my bags. I made up my mind, I'm not going back. I'm done. God would just have to forgive me. I was trying, you know, to, I was just like, okay, God, don't, you, you don't want to deliver me. I deliver myself. And um, I went, I packed my stuff and I went, got in my car. And I drove to some apartment complexes. And I was just looking. And I think it was on a Sunday. 
I was just looking and I made up my mind. I'm not going back. And the Lord told me in the car, he said, go back home. And I'm like, I don't want to go back there. He said, go back. I said, I don't want to go back. But I knew I had enough fear in me for God and enough love for God to know that I could not disobey him. So even though I was trying to make up my heart and my mind to disobey, I knew I couldn't. I knew I couldn't. I was delivered from that disobedient spirit. So I drove back knowing, I, I feeling like a fool, you know, like this guy to see me pack and all this other stuff in here. I can't come coming back, unlocking the door and everything. And I didn't know what God was doing, but what God was doing was he was delivering me. And the deliverance was, he said, if the unbeliever depart, let him depart. And then you're, you're not bound. God knew what I wanted to be remarried. I couldn't have got remarried had I left him because the unbeliever hadn't departed. I would have been the one that departed. So I, and my thing would have been irreconcilable differences. Like, look, we just don't get along. It just, you know, but um, God did it so great that we, um, he, it was a week later. I'll say that it was a week later. And, you know, if you know my story, uh, he bought some items in the house. He had went to Africa. He came back. He bought some stuff in the house. And, yes, he left. He walked out. He, he left. Yeah, he bought some voodoo in the house. It was, he bought some stuff back from Africa. And um, when I came, when he came back, there was a divide in the home. And when I, we went through, a, I went through a process in the Holy Spirit. I tell you, I don't know if I've ever heard so much from the Holy Spirit in my life. He was dealing with me through it. I mean, it was a process. That's why it's good to have that relationship with him. He was taking me through a process of do this, go anoint your house, pray over this. I mean, I tell you, I was waking up to instructions. I was just hearing instructions and everything, and God drove him out. The day that he left, I found some stuff in my house. I threw it out, and I got my holy oil, and I went through that house. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bind every devil. Devil, you can't come back in here, and this was before this man came home from work. I went through that house. I anointed every room. I bound up. I set fire to the devil, and when that man came home, he couldn't stay. He had to leave. He got in there. He walked in. He tried to put a foot in the door. He pulled it back out. And that's what I tell you, I've had a Christ experience, not, a, not a, a Christian experience, I've had a Christ experience. He came in, but he was able to get back in just a little long, and he packed his bags, and he was gone in 30 minutes. He left in less than 30 minutes, and within a week, he was already filed for divorce. So that's the thing that, that I, I've learned that, like I said, when I wanted to leave, it wasn't, God was like, no, I'm going to let the unbeliever leave. Because what, what would have happened was I couldn't have got remarried if I had left. Because you're not bound if the unbeliever leaves. You are bound if you leave. So God knew what my prayers were. He knew what my heart was. No, he did He couldn't. And I had found it. I went into full surrender. It was such a... When I tell you, if I ever had a movie did about my life, y'all, it my life has been a Christ experience. It's been amazing. And that was a time I couldn't... I couldn't believe myself what I was experiencing. I couldn't believe. I had never heard God so clearly in my life. Are you free to leave and remarry if he cheated? Yes. Yes. If, if you leave because he uh, cheated, the, uh, adultery uh, allows the remarriage. There are two ways for remarriage with God. And that is if the unbeliever leaves. A lot of people don't know that. If the unbeliever leaves or if he commits adultery. Then, or if you commit adultery, that allows him to get remarried because basically you broke covenant so that you can remarry. So don't let, any, don't let anybody tell you. And this is the thing that I tell people, abuse, I hate to talk on that, y'all, um, because it's such a controversial thing. But, um, well, I'll get on that in a minute. But I, I hate, the, th the thing about it is um, when you come out of a marriage, a lot of people are going to tell you that you can't get remarried. They're legalistic. They read the Bible. And one thing about a legalist is a legalist reads the Bible to discredit Christians. They don't read the Bible to, to come and teach you. To, it's not a love thing. It's not I want to see you free thing. It's um, why am I seeing cameras? Oh, legalists don't. Uh, when you come, you, you got Christian legalists out there. They, they really don't like Christ. They don't like Christians. They're going to come and try to discredit. Um, but when it comes to. It's important to have a relationship with God. It's important to have an intimate relationship with God so that you can get and you can hear from him. So here's the thing. 
I tell people, like, I've had people to tell me, um, what if the adultery asks forgiveness, can they remarry? If the adulterer asks for forgiveness, you can remarry him if he's in the Lord. If he's in the Lord. You want to stay away if he's not in the Lord because you're going to divorce for the same thing. Adultery is a spirit. And if he ain't delivered, he's going to do it again. It's, that's why you got some people that are serial adulterers. They are it, they don't know how to stop. You couldn't tell them to stop. You can sit there and pray. You can. It doesn't matter. You can get the Pope and uh, 500 sisters in the house. You can have somebody on the ceiling. It doesn't matter. When you're dealing with adultery, they need deliverance. But somebody else had asked me a question. What was that question again, y'all? And I, I know what I said. We were going to close. So we're going to close after this question. So um, somebody else asked the question. What was that question? Oh, can you... Abuse... Is controversial and I'm gonna get a lot of flack for this but it is not biblical to divorce for abuse you can leave but it is not biblical to divorce for it you can you can actually divorce a person but you can't remarry um, the thing about it is yeah but okay there, but there's there's a good part to it though here's a good part to it there there's a good there's a good side to it that that frees a woman um because we have to go by the Bible. You know, we, a lot of times we go to by culture and we go by a lot of things. And honestly, if you ask me personally, if I thought that you should be able to divorce and remarry, I would, yes, I would say yes, of course. But I have, I'm bound by the word. I'm bound by what the word says. And a divorce is only two ways that you are allowed to remarry. Um, of course, death, if, if the person is not living. Uh, I'll come back to that question. Um, ask, me, ask me that again once I, in a few minutes. Um, but <laughs> divorce, when it comes to abuse, there, 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 are, there is good news. I've told women this, and a lot of women get caught up in the first part of what I said, and they don't hear the second part, so I want you to hear this. When it comes to abuse, when you're dealing with an abuser, you're dealing with a cheater anyhow, he's going to go ahead and cheat too. He needs something to control, so he will let you out. It's just that you can't go and say, well, he hit me, so I'm divorcing him and I want to remarry. You, if you divorce a man because he beat you, um, which I can understand. Uh, I've been through an abusive marriage before. I can understand it. Trust me, I've been down that road. I can understand, but if you divorce him, because he beat you, if a man is beating a woman, she needs to leave. She needs to separate herself, and she can. If God gives her the permission to divorce, to divorce. But in order for her to get remarried, he will have to go. You have to wait for him to get with somebody else. You got to wait for adultery to enter, you know, and that's when that frees you. But this is what I tell people. Here's the great part. When you're dealing with an adulterer, you're dealing with... When you're dealing with an abuser, you're dealing with an adulterer. Those spirits come in networks. You will never, ever, I've never met a monogamous uh, abuser. I've never met him. I, I have, I've yet to meet him. When a man is beating on his wife, he has control issues. And a lot of times when he's hitting on her, it's because he wants to be able to control her because he knows that she's going to walk away from him. He knows that he's going to lose her. He knows he wants to break her down to the point where she'll accept everything, including another woman. Or another guy in some cases. But when it comes to that, you, uh, the woman is not bound. When I tell people, to, like I said, some people get caught up in the whole, oh, well, you know, well, yeah, you got, you're got bound by the word. But in my experience, they get caught up by the whole, well, you mean I can't divorce and remarry? It should be. Yeah, okay. In our human experience, we do feel like it should be. And I, I can agree with that. However, we are bound by the word of God. And, but the thing is, the great news is, anytime I deal with a woman who husband is hitting on her, he's cheating on her too. He's not going to hit her and not cheat. He's got control issues. And even if he's not cheating at that moment, he's going to go and start cheating. And the reason he's going to start cheating is because he doesn't know how to be faithful. A, a controller, somebody who has that type of spirit, they need somebody to control. Hear me when I tell you this. If the woman walks away, He's going to go find somebody else. He needs somebody to control. He, he's not going to have peace unless he's controlling somebody. So when it comes to an abuser, I honestly can say it's probably easier to get divorced from him than any other man. You know, you can get with a man who, I, I think it, um, a monogamous pagan 
who is worshiping another deity, and it'd be hard to get away from him. But when you're dealing with an abuser, it's easy to get away from him because he has control issues. He gonna go out and he gonna, he's gonna cheat. So when I get I come across a woman who has a husband who's beating on her, and she said, "Well, he's um, I can't say he's faithful. I just look at her because I know she don't know yet. I know she she doesn't know yet. When you're dealing with an abusive man, he'll free himself. He, he'll free you up. You know, um, somebody else asked a question, and then we're gonna close. What was that question again? When you say a woman can hold her husband back 10 to 15 years, what happens to the man that is obedient? When a, wait, my husband is trying to divorce me because of an irreconcilable differences, and he's a believer. Can he do it? Nope. Nope. Unless adultery was in the picture, he doesn't have a right. He, he doesn't have a right. It's illegal for him to divorce you. Um, nine times out of ten, are y'all still living together? Let me ask you that. Are y'all still living together? For the lady who asked the question. And the other girl, I'll get to your question in a minute. Y'all still living together? Okay. Um, I want to be careful because I, I, I will say this. Nine times out of ten, it's more than the reconcilable differences. It's something else that's present. It, it can be the presence of another woman or it can be a, a, a spirit wife. You can have what's called a spirit wife. Women can have a spirit husband. A um, man can have a spirit wife. Um, so there's you, you can't legally divorce in God's eyes for reconcilable differences. Because really what that just means is that neither person will humble themselves. That's all that means is that neither person is willing to win by losing. Sometimes you win a fight by losing it. It's not that you win a fight by winning all the time. You know. And I tell women this too. Um, I come across a lot of women who... They have contentious marriages. I said, stop arguing with the guy. I had to learn that. Stop arguing with him. Stop arguing with him. He he come in and he don't he put his, his, his shoes on the floor and he got his his drawers hanging from the chandelier. You know, just tell him about it. Hey, can you please get your shoes? And that's it. You tell him, can you get your shoes? And you you know, and if he's not willing, then you go do it. And I mean, that's the thing. Keep peace. Choose your fights back. You choose your battles wisely. Don't just fight over stuff. You know, the thing is sometimes people just spend too much time arguing. Yeah, if you've been sep now separated for nine months, um, honestly, I'll tell you this. Not, it's something else there. It's not just irreconcilable differences. It's something else. Um, most of the time, it's going to be something another person, another person involved, or it would be, um, like I said, a spirit wife. Or, you know, the only other thing I can say is if you're extremely, extremely contentious, you know, um, because you, it is possible to tear you down in marriage with your own hands. If you're extremely contentious to the point where you're always arguing, you're always emotional, you're always condescending and you're castrating him, then no man's going to stick around for that. You know, so if it's like that, then what you do is you got to you have to go through a process of not trying to reconcile the marriage, but trying to die to self. And then by dying to self, the marriage will automatically reconcile because when you die to self, there's you you won't feel the need to to handle him. You won't feel the need to go off and say something. When God took me through a process of dying to self, when married to an unbelieving man, stuff that used to bother me stopped bothering me. You know, it was like he can walk in the house and stuff that used to get on my nerves. Like if he didn't speak, that would take that would bother me. But after a while, it was like. I said, hey to you too, you know, and what have you, and it, it was a lot better from there. And um, the last question, lady, that you you asked, I wanted to get to the other girl's question first because she asked hers first. But um, what was your question again? I'll wait on her to put her question. So, And I, I'll tell you, like I said, it comes from, you know, it can be that you're being contentious. I see this with women a lot. Even Christian women, I be trying to beg them, like, stop if you only knew the power you had as a woman. You got power to, you got the power. Women have power to restore their own marriages by simply learning to keep, to, you know, to bridle the tongue. And that, that takes first, it's not just holding your mouth, it's about getting the heart checked, getting a heart delivered, and you know, from what makes it hard, like pride. You know, you get pride out, it's a lot easier you won't feel the need to respond. And then when a guy calls you up and he starts pressing buttons, 
trying to get you to react and you don't react and you just say, um, God bless you. Did you need anything? And all that other stuff. It, it changes him. 10, 15 years. That's a woman can hold a God of dang husband back. But her God of dang. I didn't understand that question. Except. Okay, ask me the question again. I, didn't, I really didn't understand it. I think I'm getting a little understanding, but I want to make sure. Ask me that question again. Okay. But, yeah. Y'all, yeah, we done went off the debt deliverance and we done got into this. I'm going through that process. What's a spirit wife? Yes, God has done that. Purge in my heart. It's the same thing as a spirit husband. It just comes out to men. It's a demon. It gives him sex dreams. It takes his desire away from his wife. It makes him magnify the issues of um, whatever problems the wife has. Um, it's the same thing as a spirit wife. It just comes in. They call it succubus. But it's, it's really a spirit wife. Men go through that. Um, they go through deliverance from that spirit too. Women go through deliverance from a spirit husband. So make sure you do some Google searches and do some research and you'll find um, information about spirit wife. But if, there is another, if there's not another woman involved... And you haven't cheated, because one thing, when it comes to cheating, American men, especially when it comes to cheating, they'll walk away quick. You know, um, they'll walk away and they'll be gone. They'll be gone for real. You know, most guys will, because it's territorial thing. Oh, you're most welcome. I'm waiting on the next, the, the other woman's question, and then we're going to close. A woman can hold her God or damn. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, you can um, push your God of day husband back 10, 15, 20 years because of disobedience. God will just have to keep him through the process, but you can push him back um, through. Like, I see some women. Yeah, if, if he's ready, she, you can push him back until God gets tired because God said, because you're a lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Now, if you get to the point where you're too lukewarm and God has an assignment for this man and you're holding back that God wanted his help meet with him, God may reassign him. God may give him somebody else. And then at that time, that just means that God has just really, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because God's not going to make him wait. God's not going to, the thing about marriages, and it just, it's not just um, you coming together to have sex and have children. It's purpose. There's purpose. Like, okay. Y'all see what I'm doing, right? Y'all see that I do websites, logos, and ministry. Okay, y'all. We're going to let everybody get back on. Look like we supposed to be closed out a long time ago, but we keep getting knocked off of here. Um, but I'm going to ask. I'm going to answer this last question. Thank y'all for the hearts. This is my pe first Periscope. So um, Friday's conference calls usually start at 9, at 9 o'clock. But uh, I was asking, let me see, did you come back on a lady who asked a question? I want to make sure that I, uh, yes, 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 Eastern Standard Time. Okay, okay. So, um, all right, I want to make sure you were still, you were back. Um, the thing about it is God said, because you were lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. If you're lukewarm, if God holds back a man back from you, it's because you're lukewarm. It's because you're not completely in him. And in a case like that, God can spit you out. Christ can disassociate himself from you. Grace is a period of time. A lot of people think that grace is, oh, I can sin for the rest of my life and I can be double-minded for the rest of my life and God has no choice but to accept me. That is false doctrine. God said in the book of Revelation, he said, I gave Jezebel space to repent, but she would not. So now I will throw her on a bed and cast her, her lovers on a bed um, with her. On a bed of laments, there's a punishment for not using grace the right way. There's a punishment. So he said, I will spit you out because you are lukewarm. I will spit you out. So if Christ spits you out, disassociates from you, automatically that man is reassigned. He's going to get a help meet because God said it's not good for man to be alone. So the... He is ready. She is not. Yes. If God disassociates from you, if God sees that you're not getting in line, yes, he will He will reassign somebody to him. He'll give him somebody. He, he has. He will assign one person, just like with me. 
I was in error. Um, I got married twice in error because I was too busy trying to do Tiffany. And I was too busy trying to do myself, trying to be, be who I wanted to be and make my own story or what have you. But God knew that I was a babe. He knew the first time I got married, I had just came to Christ. And the second time I was still a babe, he knew that. But God knows our future. God knew. He knew that I was going to get it together. He knew that I was going to die to myself. He knew. He knew everything that was going to happen to me. So God, you know, he reserved my husband. He, he had my husband ready. Yes. But he knew that I was going to get in line. He knew what was going to take and what happened. But, um... He knew, but God knows our future. So it's not like, you know, sometimes we put a human personality on God. Yes, it's the one he had from the beginning for me. Yes, it's the one he assigned me to, but he knew that I was going to get in order. You know, we put a human personality on God like he doesn't know if we're going to get in order or not. God knew he was gonna, I was going to get in order. He knew what process I was going to have to go through. He knew what man I was going to... He knew what I was going to have to go through. So he allowed me to go out and go down some roads and everything and get my little honey set on fire a couple of times. He allowed me to have, I've had some experiences that I have never shared all my experiences in books, y'all. And uh, the friends I've had, I, I tell them things that I've been through and they laugh. They say, what in the world type of life did you have? But the enemy was really trying to take me out through my ignorance. He was trying to take me out. But God knew what it would take for me to get in. Because God knew that I had a heart to serve him. I just didn't know how to. I needed deliverance. I needed a new mind. I needed people who would take the time out to speak into my life and invest. You know, to even just do what I'm doing now. I needed that. I wanted it. God knew that, you know, some people struggle. They want to do right. They just don't know how to. They need somebody to invest. Yes, it took root. And God had to take, he took me through a process of delivering me. And the beautiful thing is, after he took me through that process, I went, I surrendered. This is what I did. I surrendered to it. I let the, I let, I let what had to die, die. It wasn't easy. I cried about a lot of things that had to die. I sat back and... I remember there were times where I just felt like, I was just like, well, Lord, just take me. I'm tired, you know. But I started telling God, I said, God, kill me in the flesh and quicken me in the spirit. Your will be done, Lord. I'm not my own. And I just, you know, I just started praying like that and I started surrendering. And it made life so much easier. It made warfare so much easier. It made everything so much easier. I stopped, I stopped fighting with God. Because half of the time, the biggest issue is good um the biggest issue with a lot of Christians is that they're fighting with God and trying to fight off the devil at the same time. You know, they're wrestling with God and they're wrestling with the will of God and they're trying to kick the devil off of them. And I see so many Christians reach out to me and it's like this tug of war. They're over here fighting God. No, leave me alone. No, Satan, get behind me in the name of Jesus. No, God, stop. They over here fighting both ways. And I got to the point where I had to trust God. And say, God, you know what? I know that you got plans for me. And I, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm scared. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm afraid. I don't know. Because I didn't know God like I should have known him. And I didn't trust what he was going to do. And the enemy was telling me that he was going to break me. He was going to take me through some stuff. That's what, you know, the enemy tells people about God. He's going to break you. He's going to take you through some stuff. He's going he to deal. You know, the enemy told me a lot of stuff. And then, um, finally... I got to the point where I realized I had to look at my life and say, hey, look, it ain't like I'm doing a better job at it. You know, I'm over here trying, the stuff that I'm trying not to have is what, what's happening to me. The stuff I'm fighting to keep from ha happening is what's happening. So I got to the point where I, hey, I stopped fighting with God. I got to the point where the more I got to know him, the more I read my Bible, the more I prayed to him, the more I started loving him. And then I started, I stopped fighting with him. I, I really did. I stopped fighting with him, and I got to the point where I just started saying, you know what, God, your will be done. I started saying it. I started, your, your will be done. 
And when I found myself in my emotions, I went and prayed. I said, God, I know I didn't handle that right, but I need you. I need you. I need you. Do you know that God loves to hear those words, I need you? He loves people to say that. I went to him so many times, and I went in there, and I was in tears, and I said, God, I need you. I need you. I don't know how to do this by myself. I don't know how to, and I was honest with God. Amen. I was honest with him. I went to him and I told him, I said, I don't know how to do this. God, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how. And God took me through a process. And he took me through a process called it takes all that. When people say it don't take all that. Yes, it does. I, I'm, a, I'm a living experience. But he took me through some processes. But I can honestly say that I'm happy that I, I went through it now. I'm happy because my life has been a supernatural blessing. It's been awesome. It's been I've had some bad experiences, but God has matched them with some good experiences. He's given me a lot of really 